Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming to session uh, W28. Um, my name is Bo Hammer. I'm from the University of Chicago. And this session is titled Effective Strategies for Strengthening Physics Through Equity and Inclusion. Um, we have five very different important uh, talks um, this afternoon. Over the next three hours, I'm hoping that we have lots of opportunity for discussion and sharing ideas and reactions. Um, I think since you all are here, I think you realize this is a really important topic within the culture of the physics community uh, at large. And um, our speakers this afternoon have been very active in their own lives, their own careers, um, trying to push the culture of physics in new directions that are more equitable and inclusive and just. Um, so I'm really honored that they've agreed to join us this afternoon. And I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Linnell Williams from Harvard University. So just, just one more point. Um, this is being recorded. Uh, uh, the audio is being recorded um, so people can come back and watch the talks and see the slides. If you have a question, raise your hand. Um, and we'll try to get you a mic. Otherwise, I or the speaker will repeat your question. Um, so, Linnell. If, if the speaker asking a question doesn't use the microphone, that won't be recorded. So, yeah. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank uh, the two units who are sponsoring this session, um, the Forum on Physics and Society and the Forum on Diversity and Inclusion. Okay. Thank you guys um, for, well, first, thanks uh, to Bo for inviting me. Um, so preemptively, I want to say that like this talk might be a little unconventional. So um, I guess my background originally, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I went to Westland University for my undergrad. I ended up doing a master's in an HBCU, so I went to uh, Fisk University. Um, and then I applied to Harvard um, before I ended up, um, and then I applied to Harvard, and, and now I'm in the midst of, of finishing my uh, PhD. And it's been, you know, quite the journey, I think. Uh, so part of the, the reason why I, I feel like I was invited was because I started this project called the Women of Color Project that helps assist um, underrepresented minority women with their applications for graduate school. Part of the reason why I started that project was because someone really ticked me off during open house. Uh, so uh, I was at open house actually, um, and I noticed that there were no minority women that had been admitted that year uh, at, at Harvard in the program, not a single one. Um, and I, I guess, had the gall to ask why that was to some of the, my colleagues that were around me, and some of the th answers that I got were, um, well, specifically black women, I guess they were responding because I am a black woman. Uh, well, black women typically don't have the pedigree. Black women uh, don't like physics. Black women, um, you know, don't necessarily do well at these kinds of universities. Um, and so that really uh, made me very angry. And as a result of that anger, I decided to start a program. Since then, I've realized every single time I get angry, I can't start a program. Uh, <laughs> but it's given me a lot of perspective um, because it's, it's been, you know, I think pretty rewarding to work with the students that were a part of our program and, and pretty rewarding to work with the people that are a part of our program. So this talk is actually going to be a combination of a few things. My thoughts around this kind of idea around resources and what is a resource and what isn't, and also an opportunity for me to feature the students that are actually a part of our team because I think it's extremely important to expand our networks. and so. As I walk through my talk, you'll understand why I end up at the point where I'm actually just featuring uh, students, because I have a lot of points. Yes? Um, there's a lot of background noise, and I'm wondering if the people in the back, can you hear OK? It's not so. So I wondered if we can turn up the volume a little bit. Um, so I'm just conscious of. It's fine. <laughs> and I also have been told I need to speak louder uh, whenever, so I can also just speak louder as well. Um, so if this is fine, I'll, I'll just continue. Um, so when I was first asked to be a part of this session, uh, the first thing that uh, a while ago, the first thing that popped in my head was, okay, I've started this project. Let's talk about resources for black and brown women in particular in STEM. Um, but then that just didn't fully sit right with me. And part of the reason why is because it's really hard to define what a resource is specifically and what that looks like for black and brown women in particular. Um, and so 
I just wanted to ask a question, and, and also I want to preemptively say, I feel like I want this talk to also, I, the reason why I structured the talk that I did really isn't uh, to provide you guys with specific solutions or answers, but it's, it's to get you guys to think about things a little bit differently and to prompt some discussion around this topic. Um, so what does it mean to be a resource? So if you look up dictionary.com, it says to provide a person or an organization with materials, money, or staff, and other assets necessary for effective operation, right? Um, and that's gonna vary based off of where students come from. Um, that's gonna vary based off of their personal experiences. That's gonna vary based off of what institutions that they're in. Um, and I think that we have a lot of conversations already about programming and, and, and um, scholarships and, and, and um, different efforts that provide resources for um, black and brown women in particular. What we don't talk about are barriers. So what does it mean to a barrier? And that's basically anything that serves to obstruct passage. And I think within this conversation of diversity, equity, and inclusion, we don't think about how, even as we're trying to create resources for um, uh, people of color in particular in this community, we don't think about how we can simultaneously be coming barriers ourselves along the way and throughout this process. And so, I want to kind of restructure this talk and also while we're talking about resources, while we're talking about you know, the different things that I've sort of experienced and um, the different topics around um, trying to improve this community, um, I want to sort of propose this question and we're not gonna answer this today, but like think about this moving forward and in the future, you know, how are we like being conscious of the ways and you know, that we can actually become barriers to people of color in particular, black and indigenous people who are in STEM, especially if they're women, especially if they're gender minorities, um, and being open-minded about that. So I want to first say, as we're starting this talk, um, I'm speaking for myself. Um, I'm also speaking for my experience as a black woman. So my program is for black and brown women in particular, black, indigenous, and Latinx women in particular because they're so underrepresented in STEM. But at the end of the day, my experience and my perspective is that of a black woman. The other thing I want to add, and this is a potential barrier that I've actually seen consistently even within the DEI community, is this gaslighting culture, where if one black or brown person says something, it suddenly automatically negates the next person because it aligns more closely with your views. So I want to actively say and sort of practice, and hopefully I, I hope I encourage other people to practice, that this talk today and the things that we, we discuss as, we're, as I'm going through my presentation, um, aren't used to gaslight any other black woman or any other indigenous woman or any other woman of color or any other person of color who might have a different perspective than I do on these specific topics. I'm speaking from my perspective and from my journey and I think it's okay if we allow some space for us to be able to have these conversations and allow for us to talk about these things with you know, allowing people of color in particular to, to maintain their humanity. Right, and not sort of be, be forced to adopt you know, um, one person's ideals on, onto the, the next person. I think that, that that level of humanity is robbed from us often in these kinds of spaces, and so I want to explicitly say that. The last thing is, like I said before, the goal of this talk for me isn't to give you any solutions specifically or any answers. It's really to prompt some discussion, uh, give you some perspective, um, talk about a few things that probably haven't been commonly discussed in our community. So, we are going to get started. Um, this might be triggering for some people, but we are operating under the bare minimum, and I want people to think about that. If this country decided to think about the history that it's had, it's had with black people and indigenous people in this country, and decided to say, we're gonna carve out space and money for you guys, we're gonna open up seats, we're going to give you this passageway, we're gonna ensure that you're successful. We're gonna train you in these positions to make sure that you are successful and that you uh, get back the sort of equity that we've lost throughout history and, and time as a result of racism and all of the other isms that are attached to our identity, then that would be the bare minimum that this country could do for people like us. So I say this explicitly because I often 
or often view or have witnessed a level of, um, I wouldn't say tokenism, but I would say needing to have like the gold star and the sticker and all of these other things to uh, incentive to participate in DEI work. I would encourage that we all remind ourselves that what the bare minimum is so that we understand that to some extent anything we contribute whether it's you know a small thing that day to day hey let me have a conversation with a person of color or like let me have a person on their journey or let me uh, participate in this huge program or let me start a program is still under the bare minimum and I hope that that you, you keep that in mind um, and I say this because when we forget that we're operating under the bare minimum, it makes, it makes it difficult. I don't know if, am I going in and out? Okay, so it makes it difficult for people of color or people who come from marginalized backgrounds to criticize or acknowledge the things that they might want to change or see changed. Even, with, even within a community that is actively doing the work, there's still a lot of growth that needs to happen as well. And I think that I would encourage people to just be a, a bit flexible around what they feel they're doing for people of color, what they feel they're doing for people like me in particular, so that they understand that like, as we're operating under the bare, bare minimum, we can always keep you know, striving towards that, okay? Um, so I wanted to say that explicitly. Um, I don't know if anyone has any comments or questions, but I, I do have a few more slides to, to get through as well. Cool. Um, the other thing I want to note that I've sort of observed and one thing I want to put on your minds is that many of us uh, are seeking answers because we want to ignore the trash that we're trying to hide within our universities. Sometimes the answers that you seek are right underneath your nose. The students that you have not served, the students that you have failed, the students that you might consider to be angry are actually probably the people that you should be trying to talk to as much as you possibly can, if they allow you to. Of course, you can't stalk anyone. Oh, <laughs> you can't stalk anyone, you can't, you, you can't force anyone to participate. But the thing is, I think that this culture, and, and I guess my point of this like whole talk is I'm challenging this community you know, to think a little bit deeper about how we're going about this work. Um, but what I often see is this, like this guy is like taking his like trash and like putting it underneath the, the little planter there to try to hide the fact that like this is actually happening and if we were more transparent about what the reality is, we could actually continue to improve. So before you go to this random person that you know or this person you met today who's talking to you and say, hey Linnell, what, you know, how can I fix my department? How can I fix you know, the DEI community or physics community? Think about the people that might already be around you that you might not have already talked to, the people that might have had these difficulties, who e even if it's in the form of an email, find those emails, find those complaints, right? And you, starting there I think is a really impactful, really important place to, to look into before you start reaching for people that might align more with your own views. Okay, so I would also say that not all of our journeys are the same. So we live in a culture where we say white and people of color, right? We just completely erase all of the uh, different identities and ethnicities and different experiences people have under that POC umbrella. There's a reason why even today I use the word BI, there's a, always a new acronym, but BIWOC or black and indigenous people or BIPOC or all of these other acronyms where, where we keep separating us ourselves into these different acronyms because we consider all of our experiences to, to be the same. And at the same time, we also do this within, I have just witnessed this in, in programming efforts, et cetera, where we say people of color and then there's like a subset of people, for instance, I'll just use for, for instance, there have been programs I've been a part of where in particular their black students in particular were having a difficult time. And people didn't understand, well, why are the black students in particular having a difficult time? Well, maybe because the black students in your program have a black experience. Right, and I think it's okay to, to be open-minded about how these different experiences might impact people, whether it's our uh, skin tone, whether it's our ethnicity, whether it's our class, whether it's our, you know, we're, we're just gonna have these different experiences, right? And so I think that we often seek um, a solution that will, you know, uh, cover all of a, 
all, they give us all of the answers or model every single experience as possible, and that's just not realistic, especially. So one thing I would truly encourage this community to do is to try to be mindful of when you're doing that and be mindful of how uh, this sort of, uh, you know, combining of, of everyone's experiences is harming people, especially if they're coming from very specific um, backgrounds. Cool. All right, so this is gonna be pretty deep because um, I think sometimes we think that if we solve all of the issues in the physics community, we've kind of like solved racism. And I, the way I try to think about this is like this very common like uh, thermal dynamics problem that we have where you take um, your system and you put it in a bath and the bath has a temperature and you can like exchange, you know, temperature between. Um, even if everyone in this room today was like anti-racist and everyone on this floor was anti-racist, it does not mean that we live in an any less anti-racist country and that that culture outside of the physics community isn't seeping back and forth between the physics community and the outside. I'm not saying that we shouldn't fix the physics community. I'm saying that giving this sort of perspective around what the broader community is and you know what my our experiences are as like people of color in particular remind like I I, I go to Harvard if Harvard decided to be a perfect apartment tomorrow, that will not that wouldn't will not stop me from walking out of Harvard and still being a black person in this country. And that's important, I think, for people to 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 keep in mind. Um, but I, I really like this example because uh, I, it's it's as if we want to uh, we forget that the 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 bath uh, and the temperature can be exchanged both ways in in this community. Okay. Yes. So. We always talk about seats at the table. Um, and, you know, I showed you the bath problem, and, you know, for the bath to sort of change temperature and get out of that, like, insulated system, we have to provide work, right? There has to be a level of sacrifice. Um, and first, I want to also acknowledge that, like, this kind of work is emotional. It's draining. It, it does cost a lot from people. No matter who you are, like, if you're a part of this community, it, it it cost work. Like, I don't want to like rob anyone of their humanity. Um, but at the same time, we're not going to get anywhere if the work that people are willing to do is only within their means. So we talk about having more, you know, getting more like people of color seats at the table, right? And those seats tend to like move back and forth more slowly. And, and even within the DEI community, there are a lot of seats that are not occupied, and a lot of power that's not occupied by the very people that we say that we're trying to help. Um, and I, you know, hopefully, maybe one day, some people are willing to step up out of their seats, whether it's, you know, a powerful position, whether it's an award, whether it's a position. I don't know what that looks like. I don't have the answer for that. But I guess my point of this slide, or, or even showing this slide, is to really say that there is, at some point, if we keep operating within our means, at some point, we're gonna like hit a wall. And it's gonna require that some people allow a level of personal sacrifice. It doesn't have to be an individual, but even if it's you know, a university or an entity, there's gonna be a level of work and personal sacrifice that pushes people to work outside of what their means are to allow people who are coming from these backgrounds to occupy space and to occupy power, right? Um, and that's important to consider in like the grand scheme of things. Okay, so I've talked about a lot of perspectives and a lot of things that I have thought a lot about since starting this or thinking about what to present today. And I guess the sum of it is I, I challenge the, the before, you know, I, I challenge the physics community to do better, but I also challenge the DEI community to do better and also just be mindful of when and where you're also creating these barriers as well, even within the work that you're trying to do to improve the community. Because if we can't do it, how do we expect these other people who don't care at all to, to do that kind of work as well? So what can we do? And so this is where I'm transitioning into the other part of my talk. I don't know how much time left I have, but I, I did want to allow for a discussion. 12 more minutes, okay, let me get through. For the talk, okay, great. What can we do in my opinion? Um, and this is just my opinion. And it's very simple, actually. Um, let's stop the lazy networking, right? Let's stop the, I know one black person, I know one indigenous person, I'm gonna keep calling on them 10 times to do the same thing. 
Let's expand our networks because a lot of our networks are very much the same and we should probably include more people in those networks. Um, so that's one thing we I feel like can make a huge impact. We need to make our networks a lot less white. The other thing is support our individual journeys and don't rob us of our humanity. So some of us want to be academics. Some of us want to be CEOs. Some of us want to be activists. Some of us want to work for corporate. Some of us want to do art, okay? And some of us want to do some combination of all of those things. But at the same time, you know, we should be allowed to sort of uh, curate our journey and curate that mentorship based off of our individual interest. And so I would like to encourage people to try to, when they're thinking about mentoring minorities or mentoring people of color or mentoring black students or mentoring underrepresented minorities, I don't think there's a single answer because we're people, we have our own journeys and we have our own likes and our own dislikes and our own thoughts. So if you meet a student who wants to be a biologist, help them be a biologist. If you meet a student that wants to you know, go into patent law, help them become a, like, a patent lawyer. Don't just like stick this like, one size fit all uh, sort of solution or journey or mentoring step, et cetera, on this one person because it might have helped someone else or that's what we're supposed to do. Um, so one thing I would highly encourage is that we uh, think about how helping people like me, people like um, people who are in this community who come from underrepresented minority backgrounds on their individual journeys as well. So the Women of Color Project I spoke a little bit about before. Um, I just wanted to briefly say it's basically a three-day workshop where we help students with their graduate student applications. Uh, we try to support students virtually and uh, in person. Uh, we're trying to plan an in-person conference soon. Um, we've been supported by Harvard and the Heising Simons Foundation and SECOM and many others. And if you want, we can take like 30 seconds to take a picture. But uh, if you want to um, reach out to the team, this is uh, the Women of Color Project's uh, information. And I'll do this a few times actually as I, so keep your phones out, uh, as I like go through the next uh, slide. Yeah. So I said, expand your networks. Oh. Okay, yeah, I was gonna go. Expand your networks, help us on our individual journeys. So I'm gonna provide you people who have given me their permission to share their information because I don't own them. Um, what they're doing. So I wanna highlight the people, women on my team and the people I've been working with. So this is Mache Aaron, she's at Johns Hopkins. She's a PhD candidate. She likes to study minerals on Mars. Um, this is her social media contact. So if anyone in this room is interested in environmental science and astronomy, you should reach out to her and say, hey, like, come and give a talk. Uh, maybe be on this panel. Maybe, you know, here's a, 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 you know, some advice about grants or whatever. Like. This is Mache. Danita Douglas is a uh, student at Rutgers University. Uh, she's from New York. Uh, she's a mathematician, but she also likes neuroscience um, and psychology. Uh, she does a lot of STEM advocacy stuff, so I purposefully had the um, interest there because, again, like I said, some of us want to do science, some of us want to do advocacy, one of us, some of us want to do all kinds of things. So um, here's her contact information. Um, she's also been uh, part of our team since the very beginning. And these are all like really excellent people. Okay. Janelle Gonzalez, she is currently a PhD student at Johns Hopkins. She's from Puerto Rico. Uh, she studies exoplanets. Um, she is also in DEI advocacy. Um, here, her, here's her information. She also plays the trombone, actually. When I reached out to her, I was like, I didn't know that you played the trombone. So if anyone's a musician and they need someone to like join their band or something, they need a, someone who plays a trom the trombone, like you could reach out to Janelli. Haley Carrasco is at Kent State currently. She's a medical student. So if anyone's in, interested in, in things that are a part of the medical school, you can reach out to her. Um, she's an, a physicist specifically, but she, she is uh, in, in biology. Um, and uh, yeah, she does a lot of tutoring for, for Onakita as well. I wasn't able to share her information, but I still wanted to highlight her. Uh, Fiona Williams is currently a uh, PhD candidate at Harvard. She's also an IBM fellow. She's from Jamaica. She does 2D materials, um, and she is currently also a tutor at Onakita, which is a, pr a program I will also talk about at the end. Um, and here's her contact information. Okay. 
Yara Youssef is uh, Syrian, and she's also a part of our uh, team. She's from the University of Barcelona. She's an astrophysicist. She studies gravitational waves, um, does a lot of STEM and disability advocacy kind of, advocacy kind of stuff. And this is Yara. Wasn't able to get a photo for her, but again, I respect people's like choices. Fazile, um, she is actually from South Africa, uh, and she's a master's student currently and a mathematics high school teacher. Um, she's really passionate about mathematics and chemistry, um, so if you are interested in connecting with uh, people who are currently doing math um, in, um, on the continent of Africa, she's someone that's very well connected and is also interested in um, DEI work. And then uh, last but not least on our team um, was uh, Professor Denae Montalban. She is currently at UNAM. She's a professor there. Um, she is currently in Mexico and she uh, studies artificial cells, liquid crystals, and biological liquid crystals. So if you're a professor who's interested in collaborating with her or talking to her about liquid crystals, please reach out to her. Yeah, everyone, take a second. Okay. Cool. So I wanted to make sure that I highlighted the women that were willing to be highlighted on my team because I think it's important that people know who they are and that we try to expand that network and get people to un you know, know that there are other black and brown women who are in STEM, um, specifically in physics. So most of these people were physicists, um, but a lot of them are also in, in other in, uh, disciplines. So I thought it was important for me to, to share their information with their permission and also let you guys know who they are as well. Last but not least, some of you guys might be familiar with this person, but Professor uh, Nia Amara runs a very wonderful uh, program called Onikita. It is a tutoring program for black and brown students that's completely free. A lot of our students are in the Oakland area, but it's really a program internationally, so I'm also a tutor for this program, and I tutor a student who's in Ghana right now. If you're interested in joining Onikita and donating to Onikita and supporting this program that was started by Professor Nia Amara, who's a good friend of mine and a mentor, um, please feel free to use the QR code and, and reach out. Cool. And I'll let this be my last slide, but thank you for letting me speak today. Hopefully I prompted some thoughts about the community and how we can sort of improve. I'm not claiming that I have all the answers, but I'm open to, to questions. Thanks, Anel. That was great. Um, I think we have about 10 minutes for Q&A, um, so please ask a question. Um, so I guess I have a couple of comments, maybe not questions, but you can give me your thoughts. Um, I was thinking, basically, we suffer in this country from a, rule of mi a minority rule, right? So that would be one thing to fix on the long list of things to fix. Um, but from my perspective and from some of the data that I've seen presented throughout the conference is that we are the majority. So I feel like I'm, I'm kind of, I present a very optimistic personality, but I have the pessimist buried deep down. So I am kind of critical on the issue, right? I can see kind of like, I like to think that I see uh, multiple perspectives. But because we're the majority, I think that the long list of issues is something that we can tackle on every front. We have the people to do it, the motivation to do it. Um, it's just a matter of putting our heads together and figuring out how. Um, maybe one of the critical issues with that is that people who advocate for these ideals often tend to clash heads on how to go about this, right? So just uh, something to keep in mind, maybe offer your thoughts. Yeah, I think that it's like allowed to have different perspectives on how we go about this. I think it's impossible that like we're all going to come on to one solution. But even when you talk about like the the fact that like we're the majority at this point, um, but it, I think that the this kind of relates to what I mean by we get to a point where we kind of like bump heads with power, right, and access. And I think that's the issue is power and access. So you walk into a lot of places, you'll notice that certain people are taking out the trash and certain people are sitting in offices and certain people have certain um, positions. Um, and so until we sort of not just improve the numbers, we improve the access and the power, we're not gonna make a huge amount of change in terms of the circumstance for people who come from these backgrounds in this country. Oh, 
Thank you very much. Could you put back the slide where you had all your organizations so I can take a photo of that? And then, um, Mike, uh, that, yes, that one, thank you. I, uh, through the Association for Women in Science, 20 years ago, no, more than 20 years, nearly 30 years ago, I helped run a mentoring program at Stanford University where women postdocs mentored women graduate students and, and so on. Um, what's your opinion on how similar does the mentor need to be to the protege in their cultural background to be a useful mentor? So my opinion on this is I always tell students you can have multiple mentors. Um, I think that there are limitations. So I don't expect my, uh, my advisor is a South Asian man. I do not expect him to understand my experience as a black woman. That, is, that just will not happen. Um, but I, I do try to encourage people to work with people's strengths and their weaknesses um, when it comes down to that. Also, just because you have a mentor that is similar in identity doesn't mean that they may not necessarily, it depends, necessarily be the best mentor in terms of, um, for instance, your uh, career. Like, I'm not going to talk to another astrophysicist, no matter their identity, about biophysics. I'm a biophysicist. I study virus self-assembly. But when it comes down to my identity and my culture and the, the things that impact me, it is extremely important for me to have someone that is uh, able to provide that part of me. But the way that I go about it personally, again, I don't have a answer for this, but the way I tend to navigate these things is I have my mentors who help me with science. I have my mentors who can help me with both science and my identity. And I have my mentors who help me with my identity and all these other aspects of my uh, experience. Um, so I don't believe in the all-encompassing mentor personally. I think it's a huge disservice if people try to force uh, their um, force their way through. I also encourage mentors, in my opinion, to take a step back when they need to. So if they're not the right person to talk about certain things with their students, if they're not able to provide that resources, that service, you're going to be disservicing the student at the end of the day. Um, so it's it's really hard to kind of like think about what it means to be the best mentor for a student. I, I try to be open-minded about like having a mentoring network and having the people that are able to provide the things I need for my identity and the things I need for my science at the same time. And if they both overlap, that's great. Um, but I don't think that any student should be forced in a, into a bad mentoring relationship um, You know, just because someone wants to be their mentor, wants to advocate for them. Um, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, one of the problems I think we've probably all noticed uh, with EDI work is the sort of diversity tax, where the people who are trying to, to fix the problem by doing all this work are usually the people impacted by the problem, and then they have to spend more time uh, mentoring others and contributing to these programs and sitting on panels, and then they can't advance their career or spend as much time advancing their career as people who aren't participating in this project. So I think that's a huge issue. And over the years I've worked on these, I haven't really seen a good solution for it yet. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that or if you've seen particularly good strategies on addressing that issue. Um, you should ask. They can say no. Um, you shouldn't burden people, you shouldn't continue to go, but also it's hard to say no sometimes because I don't think people recognize when you have, when you share certain identities with, um, that, you know, overlap with like the groups that you're trying to help, it's a much more of an emotional cost. So even saying yes is going to be like, like you, you'll feel the need for, for me personally, you'll feel the, the need to say yes because you're like, well, I know I'm one of the few, I know that people need to see me, I know people need to like hear my story. Um, you know, I, I, like I said, like people have choices. I think that it's like, again, most important to support people in their individual journeys in particular. So you might ask someone for a DEI talk, but are you gonna ask them about 
also coming back for a colloquium, are you going to ask them about, you know, collaborating? Are you going to ask them about grants? Are you going to ask them about a, are you going to nominate them for a science award? Like, there, you can ask multiple questions um, other than, hey, can you come and uh, do our, our DEI panel or talk or whatever? So I, I think that there, it can go, you know, of course you can say no, but also acknowledge the fact that sometimes it, it can be a bit of a, um, more, more of a, a burden on, on people like me in particular who feel, we feel this, right? It's not just a theory, it's not theory, right? We're, we're experiencing it, we're feeling this all the time. And so I, I, I think that it's, if you wanna be more conscious about it, ask about all of these things at the same time. And if you see someone that doesn't, for instance, normally do DEI work or they haven't placed that in their resume and stuff, don't ask, like, just don't, don't, don't make that to be the first thing that you ask them about. If they say, I'm a professor astrophysicist, blah, 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 XYZ University, then you should be reaching out to them about that first, especially if they haven't actively said, this is you know, something that I do. I think we have time for another question. Um, so I, oops, I wanted to mention that uh, since we don't have all the answers and the solutions yet, uh, that puts us in, I think, a comfortable position because we can really approach this as scientists, right? So some of my friends make fun of me because they say, oh, you're just looking to make mistakes. No, I'm looking to learn from them, right? So if you don't know, you kind of have to put yourself out there and experiment. Um, so you might get yourself in a little trouble, but at the same time, you'll learn your, how to get yourself out of trouble, right? There's not gonna be an easy way to do this. You just kind of got to explore the space. And as we explore the space, we're going to educate ourselves and essentially learn the directions that we need to go in. Do you have a reaction? OK. Anyway, I think we're out of time for questions. Um, thank you so much, Linnell. Toggles up there? Yes, it's what's it, no, I don't see any. See anything. computer in computer one, computer two? Right. So it's it's so she has the toggle. I think they have their toggle wrong. They're doing memory viewer. Their toggle's wrong. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so do we do any tech support? Because their toggle is wrong. Okay. So just a brief break. A moment while we figure out the toggle. I am so sorry. I think Fred went to go.
this actually is. No, but you don't see uh, it all. So when I press this button, it's going to the wrong one. It's going to memory viewer instead of the... So we need to use this computer. Is this an app? Yeah, but it worked on the other one. It worked on another machine, another one of those. So it's just that it's on the wrong setting. It's on memory viewer rather than input one or input two. I'll fix this. It's not switching over. Yeah, it might not detect. What is it, a Mac? So yeah, you got a Mac. Been having this problem See, all it's day. on no signal. It's on number one. It's not on. Uh, yeah, it, it, that's that's the signal that's coming out of this directly to the uh, directly to the projector. So my computer worked perfectly fine with all other monitors. It was the other one, so I, it should have worked with this one. Okay, that's this computer here. Yeah, and then I press that button, and then it doesn't see it. Some reason. It's like on other. Okay, here, do this. Go back to that. Just go back to that one. Perfect. Yeah, PC1 is perfect. Okay, and that's only one. Okay. Okay. There it is. That's you. That's me. That's, you know, let's go back to like 30 minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can switch it back. All right, we are back in business. Um, just, just introduce so we can get yeah. started. Okay, thanks everybody, thanks for your patience. Our next speaker is Rigoberto Hernandez from Johns Hopkins University. Wonderful, thank you very much, um, Bo, for the invitation and thank you to the other speakers. I'm really lucky, I'm, I already enjoyed the first presentation, although I think she left. <laughs> Oh, this is unfortunate, but okay. Um, many of the things she said made me think about things that we could um, work in together, and I, I learned a lot from the previous talk, and I'm sure I'm gonna learn from others. Um, I am a physical chemist, chemical physicist, so as a consequence, I am um, the, ch and I'm the program chair for the Division of Chemical Physics, but I'm also a faculty member in chemistry. So be aware that I am a, uh, somehow on both sides of it. And so sometimes I'll be talking from the perspective of what we've done in a chemistry community, which I believe that we can also do in the physics community. And so this is the positionality where I'm coming from. I'm gonna t unpack what oxide is in, in a second, and I'm gonna lead towards what I wanna call discipline-based diversity research. And I'll tell you what we mean by that. And um, just as a prelude, think about what PER, physics education research, that's this, uh, physical, physics education research, that, uh, or more generally would be discipline-based education research. You know and understand that you have to do DEBER, or PER, differently than you do chemistry education research. Why don't we also have to do that with diversity research? Should we not think about the specificity of our different disciplines? That's the, one of the outcomes I, or, that I hope that we will get to through this discussion. First, I should tell you what the Open Chemistry Collaborative and Diversity Equity, Oxide, the two C's become an X. If you have the unique ability of dyslexia, it was really easy to see that. If you have the unique ability of, speech, of speaking in Spanish, you would say OXIDE. So OXIDE is very much immediately um, the acronym for the Open Chemistry Collaborative the equity. And what is our collaborative? Our collaborative is a partnership among department chairs, social scientists, and diversity communities to advance diversity equity within our discipline. And we picked the chairs because they have power. They don't think they have power, but they have power. Also, in industry, it was seen, has been seen, it's been evidenced that middle managers, when held accountable, actually advance diversity and inclusion. Who are the middle managers of the academy? Department chairs. Let's hold them accountable. How do we hold them accountable? By giving them the tools to succeed. Don't just tell them that they're bad, tell them how to fix it, right? But who should tell them how to fix it? Themselves. 
they need to do within their own discipline contextually, how do they make their discipline better by solving the barriers and challenges that our disciplines have created towards diversity equity. So we gather these chairs every two years since 2011. We bring in uh, social scientists, experts who bring in, who talk about the prima, fa prima facie evidence of what works, what doesn't, what barriers work or don't generally and we ask them to workshop it and say, how does this manifest itself in your discipline, in this case, chemistry? And then what are the recommendations that we can give with a disciplinary lens to other chairs and throughout the departments in chemistry to do it better, to do what better? Science, okay? So uh, I'm gonna tell you a bit of how we do this. This is not done by myself alone. I've, we've had several team members at the moment. Dr. Dontari Stellings is the um, associate uh, director or assistant director, associate director, and then Dr. Vardika Salman is a PhD social scientist who's working on our team. So we're gonna go through a few things. Now, I also wanna level set on what is diversity. And maybe everyone in the room already knows what diversity is, but I wanna make sure that we're all in the same place. I often say that some of these talks are, are um, possibly speaking to the choir, but we have to know what songs to sing. And I'll sing your song, and then you'll sing your song, and we'll both learn more. Let's uh, see what we can work on. So when I think of diversity, I mean inclusion of the other. Historically, crazily, not crazily, universities have said, we are better because we bring people from all over the world. We bring people with different socioeconomic backgrounds. We bring the best minds to our institution, so we are better. Historically, they had this myopia that they wouldn't notice that they weren't being diverse in terms of the gender binary. They weren't being diverse and inclusive and bringing the best minds along race and ethnic lines. They weren't doing this along disability lines. They weren't doing this along the identity and orientation spectrum, which here I've used as this acronym soup LGBTQIQA+, but that is not a single category. Every one of those identities is an indistinct identity. You may have more than one identity that is because of intersectionality. Um, and in the same way that within race and ethnicity, that's also not a single category. We have many different distinctions. And, but we also are in common in all of these that historically in the US we have been underrepresented in chemistry, in physics, in the sciences. And so, if we understand, a university understands that they're better if they are diverse and inclusive along these lines, then they should, be, they should understand they should be diverse and inclusive along these, under, the, these lines as well. So diversity in general is inclusion of the other. I focus on underrepresented groups because those are the ones that have been, that, uh, where the barriers are systemic and we need to fix. And um, so there's a few more words to unpack. I keep saying diversity equity. Why do I use diversity equity and not equality? Well, here's a situation where there is a baseball game, something that pe people want to see. These individuals want to see that game. And so there's a fence. And all three of these individuals, through no fault of their own, some of them are in a context where well, none of them could see the game without being given resources, but if they're all given equal resources, one of them can watch the game easily, one barely watches, and one doesn't, right? So this is, they were given equal resources. You hire a physicist, and you give her a, a nuclear magnetic resonance device, and. A AFM and a very large supercomputer, maybe access to your synchrotron, right? Every professor, you just give them equal resources. No, you don't. That would be wasteful because she only needs one thing or two things, not the others. Some of the devices are more expensive than others. The, you give the, the, your new young faculty member or old faculty member, your new faculty member, you give them the resources to the science that they want to do. That's equity, right? So equity is you give each of them the resources that they need to watch the game. Okay, so that's diversity equity. And it's not because they are, they need to be fixed. None of them need to be fixed. It's that the barrier is in the way. And one way of solving the barrier is to give them equitable resources. There we get diversity, equity, equal opportunity of the other. And well, and this is all towards being inclusive. No one is excluded. They're all, ex they're all included. But real inclusion 
uh, we'll get, get to that, would be really, or moving towards belonging, well, first, real inclusion would be, let's get rid of that fence entirely. If we didn't have the fence, we wouldn't have to worry about the equitable resources. When we have the barriers, we need to resource pr properly, equ equitably. There's another issue, which is just because you're in the room doesn't mean that you're heard. And so we, that's where belonging really comes in. So diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, the belonging part is that everyone in the room is heard. Okay, And I always tell people that if you don't hear me, then you don't get to drink my Cuban espresso the way I make it that you haven't had before. So you win if you have my little cafecito, and I win if I can see your color. Okay, Because what we know is that in the business case of diversity, from lots of data, that when companies are diverse, they are more successful. This is evidence exists all over the place about this. But in order for us to be able to take advantage of each other's diversity and uniqueness, we have to be able to see it. Right? If everybody has to check their, diverse, their color, whatever their color is, if they have to check it out the door as they come in so that we're all a single color, then we don't have a diverse room in, at all. We don't have diverse perspectives. And we're all concerned about how, what am I going to do that's going to reveal my color? So color blindness, which was a solution in the 1970s to solve diversity, equity, and inclusion, at least that's what they thought, failed. Failed miserably. Because you didn't let people bring in their color. They didn't feel welcome. They left. And when they were here, they couldn't add and make you better and stronger. So we need, uh, so colorblindness is an example of a solution that became a barrier. And we'll talk about several more barriers as well. But the point is, we, we are doing this for ourselves and each other to be better physicists, better scientists. Uh, and this is the evidence from McKinsey and coworkers, the first round of it from Sarah Prince and coworkers, where they showed that, uh, that those companies that were internationally more diverse were more productive uh, or more effective, more successful in terms of return on investment um, earnings. So our faculty, if, if we understand that we need to be diverse, are we really getting there? I don't have the numbers for physics departments. I'm going to show you the numbers for chemistry departments. They may be better, they may be worse. We, our team, Oxide, has been tracking the gender and, under, and underrepresented people of color in the US chemistry departments, the top 50, for the, since around 2010. And when we first started, it was about 16%, 16 to 17%. And it didn't matter whether you looked at the top 10, 25, 15, 75. And this ranking is according to research expenditures an arbitrary ranking, but the one that the federal agencies cared about because they were putting money into, into universities and they want to make sure these universities where they're pumping money in are training equitably. And uh, female faculty in the top 50 when has gone from about 15 to just over, now it was in 2016, 19, under 20, it's now over 20%. Underrepresented people of color, I meant to fix that. I know we no longer use URM, we use underrepresented people of color. And um, because the term minoritized is loaded and wrong. I'm not a minority as an individual, but I am a person. Uh, so the, in the top 50, we've gone from about 4 to 5% over this period of time. Let me show that to you here in terms of faculty members. What you see is that the faculty members as a whole are going from 4 to 5. Assistant, which is blue, was going up significantly over, the, over, uh, that, over 8 or 9 years. Associate is going down and full is going up. This associate going down was because the associate ranks were, um, had been undersupported. People had been under promoting our associate professors of color. And through the effort of our chairs learning about these, uh, these uh, challenges and barriers that they were putting into their fa in front of their faculty, they started to fix them. And suddenly we started to have more full professors and uh, losing the associates while still increasing the assistants. So this is a, a marker, we believe, of some of the success we've had with um, the chairs. And um, well, this is another way of logging the numbers. And so in this graph, I'm showing assistant uh, professors in red, associate in blue, full in yellow, and all in black, in gray. Or no, in black, in black. And the same thing here. But in this case, those are the percentages of women 
that identify as women uh, in a gender binary, um, what their representation is. And here, it's underrepresented people of color. Both of them have some slope. Let's look and forecast the future. They were really linear. The uh, goodness of fit was like 99%. Let's project for women linearly, which we know it's not going to be linear. It's going to be exponential decay because we're good physicists. Even if we were linear, we wouldn't get to 50%. Why would we want 50% as a target? I don't know. Availability. And, and, uh, and by the way, at the, at the PhD level in chemistry, we're at over 40% women. So 50% is not an unreasonable requirement or expectation. But we won't get there till 2062 if we are linear. For underrepresented people of color, we can get to 20% linearly in 2113. I won't be alive to see that. I won't get to count in that number when that happens, right? And, and that's just 20%. In this country, we're going to be over 50% by 2045, 2050 of, of so-called underrepresented people of color in this country, in our general population. So we are definitely needing to do something with intention if we want to change the complexion of our faculties. Okay? And, um, and by the way, we focus on faculty to some extent because they are the ones that are given all the power, right? all of the money. And you know who else they affect? undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs. So one of the challenges that we felt and started just doing this work was that many times what I hear, oh, we have to go to K through 12. Totally, go to K to 12. Lots of things that can be solved there. But you, if you are a professor at a college or university, it's a lot harder to go to K through 12 than it is in your own university. And if you solve the challenges in your own university, you solve over half the problems up the, in the stream that where people are going in. Because our percentages of graduates at the undergraduate level are not far off of the entry. There is a loss, but there's a much bigger loss um, in going from uh, through graduate school to postdoc to faculty. OK. So what are the barriers? Well, one of the barriers is that people don't see I love that picture in the thermodynamics. It's the outside world. You talk to a kid, what does a scientist look like? And very seldom do they say, oh, a paleontologist, an astronomer, astrophysicist, sorry, or a, or a chemical physicist, <laughs> trying to help you out here, physical chemist. Um, they, do they look like a woman? Is that the first thing they think of? So the Lego Institute, uh, and through the Ideas um, Program, they put out this kit where you could, in order to help people, start to see images like themselves. And the sad thing about this, uh, this set, it was ironic. Within minutes, within like an hour or so, it was sold out. Some of it was, was purchased by people who then resell it, by resellers. So I, this is my kit. My son bought it for me uh, as a gift. You know, he was young, but, but he knew it was important to me uh, from the resellers on Amazon.com. Right? But it, so the ironic result was even in the Lego world, it, women scientists were rare. Right? And that's what we're fighting against. Okay? So that's one. The other problem, there's many problems with this. So that's one problem. What's another problem? Well, I want diversity along many, many vectors. For instance, I'm a theoretical and computational chemist. I want to be able to hang out in the lab with my colleagues. Right? So that's me in there. Another thing is you might notice that they all have a single color. Okay. I used to say that they were a Lego X, and then someone said, how do you know it's Lego X? Maybe it's Lego Y. Great. This is just the same color, though. Doesn't matter whether they're Lego X color or Lego Y color. They are all the same color, and that's not diversity. Right? So we need to have diversity along many directions, and there are barriers in implicit bias. This is what I was trying to suggest, that we in our culture have ha embedded in, in people. But there are many other barriers. And in fact, one of the challenges that we have in our community, scientific community, is that we have heard so much about implicit bias that we have been brainwashed into thinking that implicit bias is the only barrier. If we somehow solve implicit bias and can do the ratings of the applications in an unbiased way, then we're going to reach nirvana that there's no barrier to diversity equity, right? But that's not the only part of the test. 
when you're a faculty member uh, and you're trying to get, in to get a job. The first test was, did your advisors write equitable letters of recommendation for you versus your colleagues through no fault of your own or through faults of their own? Did, when you arrived on campus, were you treated differently because you were unlike them? When you were in solo status because you were the only ex in the room, were you seeing the same, exam the same test as someone that was not in solo status. And there's evidence that shows that when you are in solo status, you perform differently in the, in, in the room. As a chemist, I'm super scared that this, you're all physicists. So what did I do? I told you I was in the in-group with you as a physicist. That way, I could be in the same in-group because then I wouldn't be in solo status, at least with respect to that vector. But maybe I'm in solo status with respect to another vector because I may be the only Latino in the room. Right? And we're the only Cuban, because you know what? Not all Latinos are the same. And I celebrate all my Latino colleagues, and they celebrate me, hopefully, because we have something to learn from each other. But that's even just within the one little brown category. Okay? Um, stereotype threats, etc. Oh, you're also all very, you're all physicists, and for, a long, and for a long time you believed in the power of GRE. The, the GRE exam in physics totally told you who was better and not better, right? And um, because it didn't see color. But not only are there oftentimes metaphors in those exams which are not approachable to people that don't have a particular background, but even the condition of being in that test can create threat conditions that have people perform differently. And then you say, how can someone perform differently under threat conditions? How is that possible? So let me just give you one little metaphor, a simple one. Have you ever heard of sports? <laughs> are there people who play the game of the sport? Like, they're the ones that win or lose, right? Then there's these things called coaches. Does a coach play a single minute of the game? Then why do they pay them so much money? Why? I mean, in our, in our colleges and universities, our football coaches paid more than anybody else in this. They're more important than the, than the president, right? Because they, why are they paid so much money? Ever stop to think about that? Because what a coach does, a good coach, is that gets the team to overperform on game day. And what a bad coach does is it gets them to underperform on game day. Because the two teams generally are pretty close to each other. Same thing can happen on a test. Same thing can happen on an interview. Same thing can happen giving a talk. Do you underperform or overperform on game day in that env environment? Now, there's some things that you can affect, but maybe the environment through its threat conditions makes some people underperform more than others. And there's the rub that there's evidence that shows that people from um, many gr uh, underrepresented groups underperform under threat conditions. Okay. And once you understand that, that means that in, even in hiring someone, you have to contextualize their performance based on your instrument, your flawed instrument that is inequitable to people from different backgrounds. Okay. So this idea of discipline-based diversity research means that we need to think about the barriers and the solutions in the context of our discipline. Why? Because some of the ways that we as chemists hire or promote our faculty members are different than the way you hire and promote your faculty members. So you may or may not have heard of something called the tenure tour. In chemistry, an assistant professor who's about to go up for tenure goes on 10 to 20 different departmental visits, all arranged with their network of friends so that they are better known. And if they don't do that, it reduces their probability of getting tenure. Why do we do that to people? What does it mean? It means if you have a family and you can't travel five times a month, you can't get tenure? Are you a better or a worse physicist or chemist because you couldn't do that travel? No. So we've created a system that's inequitable forward towards getting tenure. Had nothing to do with quality. You don't have to worry about that tenure tour. We do. You have other processes in physics, in your departments, that I don't have. We have to think about those processes and ask, how do we resolve the barriers that we've created in those processes while still keeping the good physics and the things that made our discipline advance? 
the way I talk about chemistry to another chemist is different than the way I talk about physics to another physicist. I know I have to do a mind swap with respect to the kinds of words that I use that will be familiar to one versus the other. And that mind swap, that language, is part of our disciplinarity. So my argument is that we need to think about diversity research with the language of a given discipline. That doesn't mean we stop diversity research in general. That means that there's another segment that we have to really think strongly. So we have been talking about and publishing the outcomes of our analysis of barriers and solutions in chemistry. And we've, you can look at our papers. Just this month, uh, it will, we're going to have an article that's going to be featured on the cover of Accounts of Chemical Research, um, which is on discipline-based diversity research in chemistry. And uh, so where we introduce the importance of this concept. Uh, when I told you before that we hold these national diversity equity workshops every two years. They are intentional, peer-to-peer, -peer, practical, evidence-driven, and they're about networking. Getting the chairs to see that other chairs are also doing this and wanting to do it better. So while I can't, I don't have a CEO of all chemistry professors, I have a community of chemistry professors that are looking over their shoulders. You can do that with physics. And in fact, this is it where uh, we did a virtual one in 2021. We just held a 2022. And guess what? Chemical engineering just held one in 2022. They saw how effective this program was. They started it and they, and we have, uh, even done um, post, pre and post tests. I don't have enough time to tell you all of the data that shows the effectiveness of these programs. Um, so what are the recommendations? I know we don't have a lot of time, but I want to give you some idea of some of the things that we found are useful. And I have far too many, so I'm going to like bombard you like a machine gun with ideas. Um, instill drivers for inclusive excellence. Um, equity, not equality, right? We got that. That was the first thing. Value, commitment, and results, not time served or availability. There's no point in have, um, on having someone come in at 8 a.m. and leaving at 9 p.m. if half the time that they're there, they're not doing anything anyway. They're uncomfortable, but if you create a culture that you have to be there from 8 to 9 p.m., there are people that aren't going to be part of your culture. Work structure, be flexible and construct it transparently. So make sure that everyone feels that they are respected and have the ability to be their authentic self. Absolute standards for RPT, recruitment, promotion, and tenure, everywhere along, not a curve. And it must be transparent. Because you know who knows the rules? The in-group. The out-group doesn't know it. And certainly, the out-group doesn't know the unwritten rules. The emphasize the genius myth. We know that, the, the, that departments that believe that gene, it takes genius to be successful are more male, are less diverse. And it's not a science problem. Philosophy is, the, is equally bad to physics, and chemistry is just right behind you. So we're trying to solve this idea. And part of it is that when you write a letter, when do you use the word genius? Are your female, fa female students more or less likely to be called a genius, even though they were better than your male students? Think about that. Pathways, not gateways or pipeline. Make sure that you think about how you go through and succeed. We're not trying to keep people out. We're trying to promote them. And what is it that, that we want to promote them? As the previous speaker said, we want to promote them to the jobs, the careers they want. It may not be a faculty member. It may be something else. Now, I want a few faculty members because that's my milieu. But it's still a success if someone succeeds. Simple. Diversity, equity is a social justice core value, sure. Maybe 20% of the people in the room, maybe 40%, I don't know, believe that we should do this for social justice. If we only talk about social justice, I'm losing 60% of you or 80% of you. I want to get 100% of you. So maybe I get another 20% of you because I convince you that it, the business case or the academic case is about excellence. Now I've got 40. Now I have to figure out how to get the, the other 60 of you. Does it, this sound like education? You we're not teaching to the top whatever, the 5% of the people that agree with us. That's what I'm going to call the top. We're teaching to all 100% of the people in the room. We're trying to make sure that everyone's on board. Why? Because if we're all on board, we're going to get to our destination. 
Define and promote diversity broadly and focus on diversity inequities affecting targeted and specified groups. This year, we look at our department, what's the biggest barrier to the success of our students equitably? Let's work on that one. You can't work on all of them at the same time. If you work on all of them at the same time, you know what happens? Nothing gets done. Pick one, pick two. After you do that, you haven't solved the problem, but you've made things a little bit better. And then you keep working. We're going to be working on this for a long time. So recognize that traditional diversity training is not effective. There is data that shows that diversity training, after it has been implemented in companies, it has led to reduced diversity in those companies. Diversity training um, certifies people into believing that their, th that their biases are, al are allowable. I am biased just like the rest of us. The question is, what do we do with those biases? Right? And this exercise, this entire afternoon, is not diversity training. Everyone's going to leave the room with the same biases that they had before. But maybe we'll all leave the room knowing a little bit better how we can uh, identify ways to work with each other better and reduce the barriers to entry and to success and to belonging for everyone in the room. Academic pedigree should be contextualized and individuals judged on what they do thereafter. Don't use schemas. You know, you might love a very well-trained dog. I went to Princeton as an undergraduate. I went to Berkeley as a PhD student. I had my um, postdoc at, at, at the Weizmann and at University of Pennsylvania. You can't go wrong with that because you've just associated with four or five great schools. That doesn't say anything about me. The flip side is, if I didn't have all of those schools, that wouldn't say anything about me either. Right? So don't just treat me as a schema. Treat me for what I bring to the table and for what people can bring to the table and what they've done with given that opportunity. And in that way, we can bring in people from a broader set of schools. In chemistry, for example, there was evidence that shows that in the top 50% of the chemistry departments in the country, about a half the faculty members have been either as a graduate student or as a postdoc in one of five schools. They were using academic pedigrees as a, one of their criteria. And if doing that, they prevented themselves from accessing very successful people. Uh, ensure that evaluations are based on qualitative, qualitative statements, not feelings or schemas. So I talked about schemas, but not feelings. This doesn't feel like a professor. They don't talk like a professor. That's not a reason to not hire someone. Make a factual statement about what they do. I have two minutes. Oh, boy. Um, be intentional. Quantify the individual. Additional administrative responsibility should be correlated with additional support. This is an answer to one of the questions I was asked in the back. What can you do for me? You know I'm overburdened. I'm overtaxed. Every time I go to a, a university these days, I spend two days, not one, because I give two talks, one about my science, my theoretical and computational chemistry science, and one about my diversity equity science. I mentor undergraduates. I mentor graduate students. I spend time with the faculty. But that's a two-day trip, not a one-day trip. I am being taxed. That's the tax. So give me time back. Figure out ways to give me time back. Maybe you give me additional support. Not because you want to be, oh, but I have to give additional, uh, give support, administrative support to everyone in my faculty because it's equal. It's not equal. I have an extra barrier that my colleague doesn't have. It's equitable to give me my time back. Professor Star or Professor Maybe. When you're making that decision to hire someone, an assistant professor, you got the person from Princeton or, or Berkeley, and they're going to be great. You know they're going to be great, and they're white male, and we know that we love white males, but, but they're going to be great, and everyone wants to be associated with that professor star. And then we have my Cuban friend here, me. Oh, we're not sure we want to hire him. He's a theoretical chemist. We don't know if he, So we're going to find out whether or not he's going to be okay. That's professor maybe. How easy is it to get tenure of your professor star? And how hard is it to get tenure of your professor maybe? And was it equitable? But you agreed to take me because you were going to give me a chance and then test me later. No, everyone you hire should be Professor Star. Everyone you hire, you should promote because you're investing in them. And guess what happens when everyone you hire is Professor Star? They all succeed. And if they all succeed, who succeeds? You. It's so easy. So always reward success. 
Um, engaging community. So in this article, we said three major buckets. Engaging community. I can talk more about diversity moments if you like later. Conduct authentic and open searches all through the process. And recognize and reward inclusive excellence. Don't overburden your faculty. And by the way, don't overburden your graduate students or your undergraduates. And by no means, when you suddenly have a problem with diversity equity, don't turn around to one of your faculty members and say, oh, you're Latino, solve this for us. Or explain it to me. Uh, in uh, the journals of physical chemistry, they wanted to amplify pers um, people of color voices. So last year, one way that they did this is that they introduced a viewpoint, they used a viewpoint to highlight a black scientist. Bill Jackson was one of the founders of the National Organization for Black Chemists and Chemical Engineers. He's also an amazing physical chemist, former chair of UC Davis, and so he wrote the first perspective. I was honored to be give the second perspective, a Cuban campesino in chemistry is academic court. If you want to know more about my own personal journey and interest, my positionality, which I did not spend enough time talking to you about, you can see this, and you can think about what you would have thought about what I was going to say if you saw this guy versus that guy. So managing inclusive excellence has to be intentional, needs to be contextualized. You want to promote a diversity culture. There are ways we can do that. Our outcomes are that we have tracked and reported demographics. We've seen upticks. We've seen departments implement solutions. And it has created advances, improvements in the climate. So there are solutions that you can implement. Read our, our materials. Talk to me. We can talk, think about how we can adapt some of those to your discipline not use exactly the same, because we have different disciplines. So uh, this idea of discipline-based diversity research has to be part of the perspective. How do you adopt it to your disciplines? So with that, I will thank you. I maybe overran my time and my students, and uh, that you can see them in lots of different places. All right, thanks, Rigoberto. I'm afraid we do not have time for questions, but um, I think Rigoberto's contact information was probably up there somewhere. Um, now we have to fix the computer. Now we have to, oh, there it is. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Um, so just one moment, we're back. I think we have to toggle it back over. Should be. There we go. Yeah. All right, thank you, Rigoberto. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is Vernon. All right, our next speaker is Vernon Morris. He's going to talk about a very interesting and powerful paper that just came out. So without any further hesitation, Vernon. Thank you much. Um, I also want to thank the previous two speakers. They might have shortened my talk a little bit. Um, but you'll definitely hear me speak in some of the same language, give some of the same recommendations. Um, I was a postdoc of Bill Jackson, so I know him quite well. I know his story quite well. Um, but um, thanks, and I'll, I'll try to jump in and speak fast enough to get through all the slides. Ah. Um, and the paper, uh, well, I'm going to talk about this particular paper that is uh, the title is Systemic Racial Disparities and Funding Rates at National Science Foundation. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to the, the team of folks uh, who are here. I am, uh, I think, taking the place of Christine Chin, who's a great colleague of mine, who I met through the course of writing this paper. Um, some of the other folks I kind of knew, but we got together and formed a nice community as we sort of commiserated, and I'll talk about some of the discussions that were going on that crystallized into this just in a little bit. Um, so the research team uh, appears um, very diverse in terms of the way that we other people. We look at them and we put them in a box. And so we look like we're in different boxes physically, or our phenotype. Um, uh, but as it turns out, we are uh, quite epistemically common, have a lot in common, and enjoy each other very much, even though we didn't know each other much earlier. So Christine is a postdoc at Lawrence Livermore right now. Uh, Arana Shapati is now a full professor at UCLA, 
and uh, runs the Center for uh, Diverse Leadership. Uh, I'm at uh, Arizona State. Uh, Justin just started at Berkeley in cultural anthropology, so a geoscientist, um, uh, also a geoscientist, Christine. Uh, actually, my work with Bill Jackson was a physical chemist, but I do work in atmospheric sciences, so I call myself a geoscientist. Um, Sarah Asara just, um, yeah, just finished her piece, uh, PhD at Berkeley and is now working with Rosie uh, Alagado at uh, University of Hawaii, Manoa. Um, Baoji chemist uh, Rosie Alagado is an oceanographer uh, and I think also just got promoted to full professor. And then Karen Andrade, uh, research associate at CDLS at UCLA with Aradna, but is now um, working remotely on Capitol Hill as a science advisor. So a lot of different expertise and energy came into this. And what I'm going to do uh, for the next couple of moments is give a little context and level set. And again, I appreciate the, the level set that Rigoberto uh, provided. It is more or less consistent with that. But I challenge some of the definitions and the value of some of the words. And so I, hopefully we can, we can get into it a little bit later. Um, but some of the discussion, at least, started with a paper, and I will speak to you um, as a geoscience. So we, we, you know physics, not very diverse. Chemistry, right behind physics. I think geoscientists are lower than physics in terms of geodiversity or diversity and inclusion. Um, but we're all neck and neck. We're not, none of us are doing well. And so a paper came out in Nature Geoscience uh, a couple of years ago now that said, no, work, no progress whatsoever has been made in 40 years. And they looked at a very specific uh, metric for that, earned doctorates uh, in ocean, earth, ocean, and atmospheric science, and the percentages, and said, look, our percentages are flatter going down. As it turns out, though, it depends on the metric that you use to know whether or not you're making progress. And so if you look at overall percentages as uh, some of the data was shown a little bit earlier. I'll show some data. Percentages don't tell the whole story. But we're not making sufficient progress over the 40 years of investment in inclusion and diversity in geoscience. Another paper, uh, this is uh, Kaheli uh, Dutt, who is, I think, no longer at uh, Columbia. But uh, Earth Science is a Whiteness Problem. It talks about the percentage of doctoral degrees. So linked to this work, but just saying that despite demographic growth, despite the population of students in the undergraduate uh, degree areas that are growing actually quite rapidly, we're not seeing that on the back end. And so this was a New York, uh, New York Times article that was linking to that. A couple other linkages to previous talks uh, and hallway conversations that I've had while I've been here this week. One, the diversity innovation Paradox. It's the great paper um, in PNAS, uh, Proceedings of National, uh, National Academy of Sciences. It was a, I think, a 30-year study of th PhD theses in STEM. And they de designed a uh, sort of a rubric to evaluate innovation. And what they found over that, and this is all of the PhDs in STEM over that 30 years, so very labor-intensive work. Um, but what they found was that the most, div the most innovative theses came from BIPOC PhDs. Despite the fact that they were innovating at higher rates for their PhDs, we know they were not getting hired over that same period in time. So they're not getting rewarded for being innovative and successful at the PhD level. This is not separate from the fact that we're not only not diversifying our faculty in STEM, we're not even on track to do it in the next 50 years. I think your, were your stats for the total STEM? I'm sorry for asking a question, but just chemistry. So chemistry, oh yes, okay. So if you look at all of STEM, it's a little bit worse. Um, and so this paper actually quantified that, looked at the rate of, our, of diversification of faculty uh, and the fact that you have to hire at a rate higher than the percentage fraction you are to beat it and get to where you need to go. It turns out we have to hire at least about four times as many 
faculty of color than we're hiring now. There's no indication of that. Uh, and then you have to balance that against the rate of retirements as well. And then the last paper was, I think, uh, this is uh, Clausette, uh, oh, this, yeah, this is Aaron's paper. Um, talked about these hierarchy, uh, these hierarchies and dynamics. And this is, again, not limited to geoscience. These, none of these are limited to geoscience here. This is stem-wide that a couple things come out. One, a great number of the faculty that we hire are sort of legacy faculty. Their parents were faculty or one parent was a faculty, or both parents were a faculty. And they had these same pedigrees. And so there's this sort of incestuous, unwritten rule that we hire our own. And our does not mean people who look like me with angry hair standing up here. It means white men or women will be hired on the basis of pedigree, on the basis of who is known, whose parents are known, etc. And that has to change, but that reinscribes the difficulty that we see here, not diversifying, it reinscribes and says, I don't care how innovative you are, we're not going to hire you because you don't look the right way. And goes back to the previous slide where we're not going to make progress. So again, I appreciate you, Rigoberto. I don't have to go through this too. All these words have been said before, but I do want to point to the fact that sometimes we're using language, we're hearing language that gets conflated, that gets interchanged when it's not the same thing. And so it's useful if we are going to make progress to level set and understand what we mean by structural racism versus systemic racism. What's institutional racism, which can combine those two things together. So I, I, I do think a very nice job was done on these, but these are distinct concepts that come out of sociology. And if you haven't read uh, Eduardo Benito Silva, please read this guy or go to a talk. He's very clear, uh, very detailed. Um, and very authentic in his delivery of what these things mean and how they continue to reinscribe. So very quickly, systemic racism, and I'll use some of these terms later, which is why it's uh, important, perpetuated discrimination within a system that has been based on racist principles, practices, and focuses on the involvement of the whole systems. And so even our academic institutions in the United States Many of them came through one or two of the Morrill Acts, which were taking land away from the indigenous to then fund the education and the resourcing and the strengthening of predominantly white males in this manifest, desti uh, manifest destiny sort of principle. And so the system is based on principles of white supremacy. Your presence on this land does not matter. We're going to erase you from the land. You're not going to get into these schools. And we're going to invest in the people that we, who took the land from you. There's a perpetuation of that as we move forward in time. Structural racism is distinct from systemic racism. And that divides, uh, involves those unwritten rules that Rigoberto just uh, alluded to. There are cultures. There are things that say, hey, when you go to an APS, you don't wear a three-piece suit. Because everybody's going to look at you a little bit strange. So you don't do it, even though there's no rule that says you don't do that. In the same way, you might walk into a room and nobody looks at you at all, or they look at you a little bit strange and don't talk to you. And the messaging is, even though it's not written in the code of conduct, you don't belong here. You shouldn't be here. There's no real space for you after you leave here. Those are structural. That's one example of structural. But they get reflected in a lot of these advantages, a cumulative advantage, which is also cumulative disadvantage for the other group. But they play out in poverty, in death rates from uh, COVID, which taught us a number of things, uh, in lifestyles, in life expectancy, etc. Institutional racism are those policies and practices. Now you institutionalize things. Now you make a code. You install the GRE. All right? So it's institutional racism. So these are distinct things. They don't necessarily decouple, but they are distinct and they play out in different ways. And they will, in fact, explain some of what uh, the statistics that I'm going to show shortly. And so the paper looked at a particular organization, the National Science Foundation, and it explored public data. Um, and it explored how that public data is playing out against perceptions. If you surveyed faculty and 
against perceptions of the model minority myths, against perceptions of diversity investments, et cetera. But all organizations um, can have some structural inequities. They don't have to be racialized. They can be based on ability disability. Uh, they can be based on language discrimination uh, or accent. But you have several types. Um, I point, I'll read the several types, but not the other font, just compositional diversity, which is what we typically fo focus on. Structural diversity, which has to do with these academic hierarchies. Uh, pedagogical approaches, epistemical approaches, curriculum diversity, perceptions of belonging, equity, justice. You know, what's our different understandings of those values? Physical structures, if you walk onto a campus and there's a Confederate, you know, hero who proudly perched in the middle of campus, how does that make you feel if you are great-great-grandson of slaves or the great-great-grandson of illegitimate rape of your great-great-great-grandmother? How does that make you feel? Do you belong? But if we don't think about those things, those just, are just traumas that we let pass. And it's okay because we, no one talks about it and it's let pass. And I say that not to trigger anyone, that's my story. Um, but it is something that I think about sometimes when I walk on some of our campuses. And legacies of exclusion, which I just uh, alluded to a little bit, but where did the land, who was on the land before? What's the history of reparations of that land? How is the university honoring the people who lived on that land and still live in the vicinity of that land? And are they, be, you know, being given any recognition of honor or justice. So I'll, I'll pause for a second, and I show this picture and ask this question. Is diversity the goal? And as you look at the picture, and if you just thought about visual diversity, this is a diverse picture. I've got at least white and black people together on the bus. If I was only measuring diversity, I could check my box and keep going. But you're probably looking at this picture and you say, oh, it's black and white, and, you're, and it came from Library of Congress uh, archives. I'm sorry, I didn't I put that on there. Um, this is a picture of a segregated bus. In addition to it being diverse, it's also showing what power and how power plays out even if you value diversity. Diversity is just a metric not a goal. It's a partial metric of our progress towards the aspirational goals of equity and inclusion. And if we do it right, justice. But diversity in and of itself can be meaningless. The way that you include people can be harmful and traumatizing. And in fact, a good friend of mine said, this is not even inclusive. So I used to say, is this diverse and inclusive? because a person on a wheelchair couldn't get on this bus. They wouldn't be allowed to get on this bus. And so we have to think about what are our goals, what are our values, and make sure that the words that we use to characterize our goals and values and the metrics that we use to measure how we get to those aspirational goals are the correct ones. And one of my points is diversity is is not one. It's been co-opted. And there were some good reasons to think about it in a certain way, but once you begin to make some compromises on the language that you use, you compromise the goals that you're trying to achieve. And you set yourself behind. So, I'm going to talk some numbers pretty soon, but I want to again thank Christine and Sara uh, who were co-founders of Asian American Pacific Islanders in Geosciences um, were at a, a virtual gathering at a meeting and were commiserating on an open secret among Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders about NSF. As it turns out, there are parallel conversations of that very same type that happened at Nobuche when I go to Nobuche, that happened at the National Society of Black Physicists when I go to those meetings, that happened at AGUs, happened at all the meetings. Um, actually, it's also the National Society of Hispanic Physicists parallel conversations that mirrored this. 
Um, and so they were having this in 2020, uh, fall 2020, actually in summer 2020, I had started a, uh, a movement called No Time for Silence. Several different um, groups came together to articulate um, programming and activities that would, could move the scientific communities towards equity. Um, one of my, one of their colleagues, Aradna Tripathi, said, hey, you should talk to Vernon. And so from that conversation, they came and talked to me and I said, yeah, we've been talking about that for a while too. What are you doing about it? Oh, we're writing this paper. You want to come along? Yeah. And we attached a couple other folks and that's how the paper um, sort of came together. I was actually looking uh, at similar data from a geosciences perspective, but we said, let's just do it across STEM. So our data sources, publicly a debatable uh, data reports from NSF. We also use some NCSES data to get at uh, sort of PhD production and postdocs and where people were. We looked at um, this time period from 1996, roughly to 1990 to 2020, uh, depending on the data that was available. So there were some data limitations um, and that has to do with uh, the way that data is collected and also the voluntary nature of some of the data that NSF collects. Um, and I should uh, take a moment here to put in a disclaimer, which I should have done at the start. Uh, I am on the board uh, for NSF called CIOS, the Committee uh, for Equal Opportunities in Science and Engineering. And that board reports to Congress biennially. I'm gonna show you some of the recent reports that I think are good reading materials. Um, but this is not a CIAS report. This is Vernon as the guy who's at ASU, not CIAS. Although it was, was shared with CIAS and shared with NSF before we submitted the publication. But data was public, uh, publicly available. And so we looked at a number of trends in as many ways as we could to try to understand what funding cycles have been like as diversity, equity, and inclusion has become more and more a common language, has been more and more of a focus, more and more efforts have gone into that. And so the overall trends, and this is an overall trend of the funding rate at NSF has taken a dip even now. There are, it's, there are fewer proposals going into NSF currently over the last couple of years than have been in the past. Um, in fact, I think even some of the journals are reporting that there's fewer publications being submitted uh, than have done in the past. But you do have some fluctuation, uh, I'm sorry, you do have some fluctuation, uh, but you have the overall number of proposals and then in black the, the funding rate at the top. The bottom chart uh, is showing um, the overall trends in funding as a function of racial uh, or ethnicity identity. The zero line is the average. And so all of the differences that you see, whether it's uh, among the groups indicated by the circles with the line, large filled in circles with the line or the smaller bubbles, um, those are relative to this average funding rate at NSF. Um, which is somewhere between 20 and uh, 30 percent. I have it on a, a, another slide. It's fluctuated a bit, but this is the mean over the period. The consistent trend that we find, uh, and I also have data for MPS as well, proposals by white PIs consistently funded at above overall rates and higher than proposals by most groups, and it's increasing with time. So despite our diversity, equity, inclusion efforts, you're building a cumulative advantage over time at the agency that is one of the agencies at least that's supposed to set this standard of equity and broadening participation. And so another way of characterizing that is to look at sort of surplus awards and deficit awards. And this again, our assumption is that intellectual ability is not racialized. It's out there wherever you can find it. And if that's the case, what it should mean is that these scholars who are submitting proposals 
regardless of race, since that's not supposed to be an evaluation metric or criteria, should be funded at the same rates. And so we plotted these box plots where each box represents 10 proposals, and that's just a graphic of what it might lead up to. Colored boxes, funded proposals, and then the black outline, uh, this is the 2019 funding rate, about 27%. And so if you took all of the proposals by white PIs, uh, who identified as white, um, then you have a sort of a surplus of awards relative to this funding rate. If you look at all of the other categories, essentially, except for Hispanic, Latino, underfunded, there's a deficit of awards that can be significant. And one of the most sig significant ones actually turned out to be for Asian American PIs. It's funded uh, the 22% versus the uh, 27%, but actually almost 10 percentage percentiles more than um, white PIs. And it's not just the number of proposals, but it's also funding amount. And we had partial data on that, but not the total data on that. I'll show you how we accumulated, you know, determine what the accumulated advantage was uh, shortly. I'm, hopefully I'm not, I think I'm doing okay on time. Um, so another way to present the trends is to look at what types of awards does NSF give out? And is there any differencing or differentiation depending on the type of award uh, that is given? And this set of plots goes through that in a little bit. So the overall funding for research and non-research uh, is shown here. So the non-research uh, awards tend to get higher funding rates. Already not a good sign given what you saw on the previous slides. Total number of proposals uh, versus awards up here and then the racialized data. So the meat of it, we're looking at these bottom plots and looking at the trend lines, um, you can sort of see that, again, no matter what type of funding it is, there's a surplus of awards if you are a white PI and a deficit of awards, although it can be closer to the norming or the zero line if you're African American. Um, so, you know, somewhat better if you're a uh, Hispanic Latino, but varies quite a bit year by year, and pretty poor for Asian American, Asian Pacific Islander. And we, you know, plot, plotted this as a proportion of awards by the group to say is if a particular group is submitting primarily training awards versus research awards, does it make a significant difference in the rate of funding? Again, um, it tends to be uh, pretty poor. And again, white about 1.4 times or 40% over those by Asian American uh, Pacific Islanders and black PIs over the latter uh, seven, eight years. Trends by uh, directorate are shown here. Uh, and if you do go to the paper, we provide all the data, all the data analysis and write up. So I'm moving a little bit quickly here, but the detailed analysis is in the publication. But for this audience, MPS might be the line that you sort of key on here. So it's the last um, vertical line on each plot by race. Um, and the overall trend is borne out across all directorates. So it's borne out across all directorates. It doesn't matter if it's research or non-research. There's a cumulative multi-year advantage if you are white and a cumulative disadvantage, correspondingly, if you are a person of color, a PI of color. Um, blowing up math and uh, physical sciences by research awards. This is showing, again, total number of proposals, total number of awards as you move across, and then just the racialized uh, sort of plots uh, down below. There are some challenges in the number of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander uh, awards. We were in a small N sort of variable there, and so sometimes you have data dropout, a lot of data dropouts actually for um, Alaska Natives, um, American Indians, Alaska Natives, um, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Very difficult. Um, but these are the numbers that were available based on the stats. Again, the trends 
stay consistent regardless of the, of the in value. One of the questions, I think I don't have it here, was does it depend on what school or what type of school the faculty are at? That was some of the data that we were, was not made available to us. It's a curious question. There's anecdotal data. Certainly I spent 20 years at Howard University, knew a lot of the proposals that were coming in. But one of the challenges there um, is that your racial distribution in the departments at HBCUs is not 100% African American in the physics department or math or chemistry, et cetera. And so what's the variability? It's a study that we hope to be able to do, but there's, there's a, you must disaggregate data in a way that you can answer the question that you're really going for. The data is not currently available or not in the form that's currently available to do that. But a good question, and if we have time for a discussion, we can return to that. Um, did I talk about this? Wow, okay. Let me pop up a little bit. So I'll try to go quickly. Um, NIH did a similar study, um, and one of the things that they learned from that, and the, report some of the papers here, one of the things they learned from that is the problem is not simply a matter of changing how you fund or changing the programs that you make available. That's sort of the punchline there. Uh, and they went on a, a, an apology tour, um, said that they're going to change things, and actually Ponch acknowledged our paper as well. So these are just some highlights of acknowledgments that there is structural racism, that there is systemic racism. It's also sort of an indication of how things get conflated because um, we're talking about multiple things here. Uh, I did want to show this plot um, about cumulative advantage. And this is, this feeds into who gets tenure, who gets seen as a success or a genius and who doesn't. Um, your ability to be mobile. If you wanted to move as your parents age, I need to move to a place that I can still do the work I'd love to do, uh, um, but need be near my parents. It makes mobility extremely hard. It makes retention extremely hard. Um, it makes being in the sort of presence of high advantage, high disadvantage, and saying, is this worth my time difficult? And so, this affects attrition as well. Um, we did look at uh, some of the hiring uh, and some of the representation amongst STEM faculty. This is, comes from uh, Closet's paper and sort of merged. But a lot of the progress that's being made, even in the gender gains in, in the faculty, in STEM faculty, is coming from retirements of older white men leaving more than is coming from the hiring profiles. Um, and so, again, it, it sort of underscores uh, some things that Rigoberto said is we've got to be much more intentional. Um, this is just, uh, again, a chart that you saw a little bit more of. I'm going to move a little bit faster, uh, so I want to get to some punchlines. It's what's interesting about the way that NSF collects data is that you do not have to report on race. And so there's a lot of arguments that this declining um, reporting on race, which can have effect on the data, but even within the data that we have, the, the trend lines, 40% um, you know, of your faculty are not going to be in the racial categories that we um, were defining. So it's not going to affect the data. But it does point to uh, the fact that we need to think about racial assignment in a different way. Uh, and OMB is about to have a town hall on racial classification and how we might get to data that we could then do intersectional analysis on in a much easier way. Um, we did look at reviews. I'll, I'll just say we, we looked at reviews um, by racial category and found some interesting things. And if someone wants to ask a question, I'll go into that. But key observations across all directorates, Proposals by white PIs funded at, a, uh, at above average rates regardless of proposal type. And the greatest disparity was for Asian Americans and African American PIs for research proposals. Um, disaggregation, critical. Um, there's a lot of trends that are masked by the way that we collect data. Uh, and we hope that we can urge NSF to collect data a little bit differently. 
but it will add critical context to look at things like gender stage, institution, career stage, et cetera. Um, huge rich get richer effect. Um, and the study's not about individual racial bias, although, as Rigoberto said, if you empower program officers and hold them accountable for equity measures, you could see a change in this very rapidly. And if you looked at GEO, there were some programs in GEO that were at the line or above for some of the categories, and that's because uh, an equity audit has been done. Recommendations for Pathways for Change, a couple of great reports. I saw Gilda at, I think, uh, Rigoberto's uh, conference as a, as a keynote speaker. Gilda Barabino was the chair of this National Academy's uh, committee that looked at advancing anti-racism, racism, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM organizations. I think it just came out not too long ago. Great, good read. Um, the EPSCOR report that just came out, um, this is proceedings of uh, actually in chemical, chemistry and chemical engineering uh, workshop report uh, I found very uh, useful. Uh, and then the CIOS report from the last biennial report coming out on leadership actions. These have great recommendations. The, the reason that a number of things are getting repeated is that the solutions are actually known. This is not a head scratcher. It's who has the commitment to do the thing that needs to be done. That's where we are. Um, key strategies for leadership, center racial and social justice across all scales. You can make the business argument, you can make the moral ethical argument, you can make, make all of them, but center the right thing. Uh, because if you center business, it's easy to then kick the other stuff to the side. We just gotta make money. And the business argument says, hey, if I'm doing well, I don't want to risk anything. So it, you have to combine the arguments together and get people on the same value scale. Do your homework and engage experts. This speaks to the fatigue. Um, BIPOC folks can't teach everybody. LGBTQ folks can't teach everybody. Um, folks with disabilities can't teach everybody. You've got to do some of your own work. Interrogate the data while implementing, implementing change. It's got to be parallel efforts. Uh, engage leadership empower them and hold them accountable, manage for change. Um, we've uh, pointed to these things um, and they will be on our website uh, fairly soon. Um, but we've got to update our data collection. The data is clear, but if we want to measure our progress as the demographics and the identities that people assume change, um, we've got to keep up with that. Uh, and so I can stop here too. Oh, this is the closing points. There you go. Be intentional, which I heard earlier, and I, you've got to do that. So I'll stop here. So we have time for one quick question while I switch over the, um, can you shuttle the oh, mic? Sorry. I feel like Phil Donahue, where are you, where are you, who's question? Uh, thank you, nice talk, but uh, it's my understanding that there's additional variables that have to be taken into account with the heterogeneity in the career stage in the directorate, and that when you correct for that in this NSF study, it can explain essentially all of the data, or at least a significant part, and the effect has to be real. I mean... So, definitely, there are other variables that need to be included, need to be uh, corrected. Uh, many of those were not uh, available. It, it, you can use the data in your paper, correct? Not completely, no, no. You have a way to show it's not complete. There are some calculations that show you can explain a significant, I mean, there are some assumptions, so it's, it's not clear all of it could be explained, but so at least some of it could be explained, which would be a significant number, though. It's not a small correction. Right, so that's where I agree with you. If you take a model and you say, I want to tune away the differentials, you can do that, yes. But you have to make assumptions that, in fact, are racialized. Yep. Well, we can talk, we can definitely talk afterwards. Right? Because you can always take a model and tune out differences. That's, that's the beauty of models. We 
Yes. Well, the assumptions are tuning. Yes. Sorry, we got we got to cut off the discussion and get the next talk. But people can talk after if there's time. Sorry about that. Anyway, moving on to our next speaker, Mary James from Reed College is going to talk about the AIP Team Up project. Ah. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, Bo. Um, so. Uh, this is really, this is kind of um, a demonstration talk that is, um, I'm going to try to do faster for you what I've done to talk about the team up project um, at colloquium for physics departments across the country in particular. Um, I just want to say a few words. First of all, only accept invitations if it is the general weekly colloquium. So I don't want to talk to the diversity and inclusion committee. That's, that's not going to further um, this work. And I'm talking to physicists. And when I talk to non-physicists about talking to physicists, I say, well, the, the, you know, the North Star, the grand thing is to change the culture of physics. But physicists are a particularly um, challenging audience in that regard because one of the myths of physics is that physics does not have a culture. So we, we and so it's very important to me as Anel was saying earlier, um, I'm, trying, I'm not trying to speak to the choir when I give these talks. I'm trying to move the middle a little bit more toward this being on their radar, something that they think about as part of their professional uh, obligations. OK, so that's the spirit of this talk. So we begin. So how physicists approach challenging problems. And here I'm inspired by uh, Eric Cornell and Carl Wyman's 2001 Nobel acceptance speech, which if you haven't read it, is a thing of beauty. And they basically talk about um, their, their process in creating the first um, Bose-Einstein condensate, which was a remarkable achievement. Einstein had um, predicted this 70 years before it was able to be realized experimentally. So what did they do? So first, they identified the goal, which was to make a Bose-Einstein condensate. Two, they, or they do not, if you're trying to do this, do not blame the atoms for not organizing themselves into a Bose-Einstein condensate under whatever condition, conditions feel most natural to the experimenter. That's a deficit model of the atoms. Okay. Understand that it is the experimenter's job to create the environment necessary for the atom's success. Four, use data, not stories about what you think is happening, to guide you and gauge your prog progress and next steps. So they were constantly measuring the temperature and des density of the rubidium gas. They weren't guessing the temperature and density of the rubidium gas. Five, be resourceful, imaginative, and tenacious in achieving the goal. Learn from the successes and setbacks of others pursuing similar goals. They were constantly talking to all the other groups that were also, there were a number of them across the world pursuing this goal and what, what was happening. Six, use every tool at your disposal to build the environment you need for success. Then invent some more tools. Success is iterative. So they didn't just use high vacuum technology. They needed all of these technologies. Laser cooling had to be invented, magneto-optical traps, evaporative cooling, and finally compressed magneto-optical traps. And all of those together combined to make the environment necessary for the atoms to organize themselves into a Bose-Einstein condensate. Seven, celebrate success. Maybe win a Nobel Prize. Okay. And eight, build on success. The, the um, creation of the condensate was really the rebirth of AMO physics. I mean, it has exploded since uh, this achievement. Okay, so now we're going to pick a new problem. This is the problem. We identify the goal. The goal is to double the number of African American students earning bachelor degrees in physics and astronomy by the end of the decade. Okay, so how are we going to go about achieving that goal? We're going to follow Cornell and Wyman's lead. We are not going to use a deficit model. So it turns out the statistics are there in the report, in the team up report, which you can find at, a, at the AIP website. African American students are successfully earning bachelor's degrees in other quant heavy STEM fields. 
they are interested in and capable of majoring in physics and astronomy. And it's one of the former, I think, um, Ricardo, you mentioned it, um, that um, we, could, we could blame the K-12 system all we want, but we're university educators. That's our level. And so what we want to do is take the students who come in prepared for and interested in physics and actually have them get degrees in physics. Okay, that's the task. Okay, so we need to create the environment for success. For undergraduates, their experience in the home department is paramount in persisting and thriving in the major and in college. That is what physics is to them, right? So it's the courses they take, the interactions with faculty, staff, and peers, physics-related work opportunities, and their ability or inability to have social integration into that environment. Okay. So, four, use data. So, this is a really hard thing for physicists because we are really comfortable with quantitative data, and we are really uncomfortable with qualitative data. But the student experience is, is data. It's real data. It's just qualitative data. But there are people on our campuses who know, how to use, who, who know how to take and analyze and interpret qualitative data. They're called social scientists. And the best thing we did in Team Up was have a number of them on the task force. You can learn a lot from them. And they actually want to talk to you. Okay. So what did Team Up learn from taking a lot of data from students, current students? It was amazing the number of times the task force members themselves said, oh, when I was a student X and Y. 20, 30 years ago. It's like, no, 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 no. We want to know what's happening with our students today. Okay? So what did to team up learn from the students? There are four essential factors to foster the persistence and success of African American undergraduates. One, belonging. Students must develop a, so a strong sense of belonging defined as an individual's feeling of being a welcomed and contributing member of the department and larger physics community. They have to develop a sense of a physics identity, that is, that they're perceived both by peers and more senior members of the discipline as future physicists and astronomers. Academic support. They need effective classroom teaching, auxiliary support for classroom teaching, advising and mentoring. All delivered from a perspective that centers the student's capability and strengths in approaching their challenges rather than defining them in terms of their challenges. Finally, personal support, which involves acknowledging and celebrating the whole student, including their interests and concerns beyond physics. That is, their commitments to family, to community, having a sense of purpose beyond attaining formal knowledge, financial stressors, physical, mental health, and wellness, and addressing challenges by helping them use resources effectively and increase self-advocacy. There was a, a quote from one of the students who was in one of the um, uh, focus groups at the National Conference of Black Physicists where we ran a number of focus groups. And they said, when I walk into the door of the physics building, I feel like I have to hide everything else about me other than my interest in physics. And that to bring anything else across the threshold is to be seen as not serious about physics. Okay. So, um, so, how is one resourceful and tenacious, learn from others, bring many approaches to bear? So I invite uh, the faculty to read the team up report and to read it as a department and to talk about it as a department. To use the, deep, the department self-assessment rubric in Appendix 8, commit to several readily retainable and several aspirational goals. Use the resources in Appendix 10 to learn from others. You don't have to read. One of the things I always say at Reed College is the great thing about being kind of behind is that you don't have to invent everything. Lots of people have done lots of things, okay? And consider university-wide or regional collaborations to support you and neighboring institutions' progress. Just like learning from the chemists, finding out what other people are doing. If you're at a big university in other disciplines, if you're at a smaller college like I am, maybe you want a regional um, collaboration. And then celebrate success and build on success. Acknowledge and reward this work as essential departmental work. It's not extra. We don't do it because we're nice. We do it because our discipline desperately needs this work done. Okay? Um, garner support and recognition from other campus offices and administrators. Let the administration know what you're doing and tell them how you can 
they can support you. It shouldn't be a big secret. Work for professional societies to elevate this initiative and acknowledge leaders in the work. Okay, so I want to go back to number three, academic support, and talk specifically, so give a model, what I'm doing here is to give a model of how a department go, might go about helping African American students with number three, academic support. So students need effective classroom teaching, auxiliary support for classroom teaching, advising, mentoring, delivered from a perspective that centers the student's capabilities and strengths in approaching challenges. Okay, so what do we need to know to bolster academic success? While the physical space is identical, and there's um, very, very robust, 30 years of very robust social science research, particularly from educational and cognitive and social psychology, um, to, to back up what I'm, I'm going to say here. While the physical space in which students enter is identical, the social psychological space is not. Students are literally not walking into the same classroom. I want to talk about four things that are happening for students. Um, these aren't specific to African American students, but you can see how um, how African for all of these African are salient for African American students. So the first is ph imposter phenomenon. We've all felt it at some time in our lives, but it can be exacerbated by contingent identities such as race, gender, gender identity, etc. That is, to walk into your freshman physics class, I am the admissions department's sole mistake. Everyone else here is better prepared, more confident, and will be more successful than I. And soon I will be found out. The second is, um, oops, went backwards. Stereotype threat, which is distinct from imposter phenomenon. So this is a quote from a student who came to visit me in my office when I was serving as the Dean for Institutional Diversity and on leave from the physics department. But she said she had, she just made an appointment. She said, I heard there was a woman of color physicist on this campus and I just wanted to meet you. So I said, oh, come in. She was a freshman. Oh, come in, come in, tell me, tell me about your class. And at one point she was talking about being in a discussion session the week before. And she said this, I am a woman of color and my two workshop partners are white men. So they go up to the board and they work on a problem together. But one person's got to hold the chalk, right? I was at the board working on the problem and they were behind me watching. All of a sudden, all I could think about was how if I messed up, these white men would think women of color can't do physics. I know I shouldn't have been thinking about that, but I couldn't help it. So this is, Claude Steele did the um, foundational work in this. He wrote a wonderful book called Whistling Vivaldi, which I recommend to all of you. Um, and it's basically that we all know the, stere the negative stereotypes about our group. And when we have to perform something about which we care deeply, you have to care. So for instance, academics aren't good athletes, so I go out on the tennis court and I prove that. I'm a terrible tennis player, but I don't care so I don't suffer stereotype threat. But if she cared about being a good physics student and therefore that's when it had, and so it completely um, takes over her cognitive abilities just when she needs them to solve a physics problem, okay? Belongingness uncertainty, distinct from both imposter syndrome and stereotype threat. Belongingness certainly said, maybe I'm really confident in my abilities, so I don't have imposter phenomenon, and maybe I'm not going to worry about stereotype threat because I'm that confident. But do I belong here? Do I want to be here? So there's the, the most famous study is on women, a Stanford study on women considering a computer science major. They had all done very well in the introductory com computer science course, receiving an A or A minus, and they knew it. They already had their grades. And they were asked to come into the computer science lounge and take a brief questionnaire on whether they were considering a computer science major. There were two lounges. Half of the participants went into a neutrally decorated um, uh, room. It had, you know, like a waterfall or something on the a wall. And the other half of the women went into a room that was completely decorated with gamer paraphernalia. And if you know anything about gamer paraphernalia, it's kind of a 15-year-old boy's wet dream is what all that stuff looks like. Okay. So, I'm sorry, that was a little crude, but that's really what that stuff looks like. Okay, so, so there was a 
statistically significant difference in the responses of the women of whether they were considering the major just based on which room they took that study in. So the physical environment itself, what the walls were telling them about who does computer science and who doesn't, had a profound effect on whether they were considering what they were going to do for the next four years. Okay. And then finally, a fixed versus growth mindset. And this is work um, popularized at least by, or um, uh, done by Carol Dweck, also at Stanford in the psychology department. And basically in a fixed mindset, when you can have fixed and growth mindsets about different aspects of, of your life and your personality, et cetera. Basically, for our purposes, in a fixed mindset, intelligence is immutable. So I only have so much, and soon I will be expelled. And I've been in the smart bin all my life, but now I'm in college. And soon I will be expelled from the smart bin and thrown into the not smart bin. Okay which makes education, it's just running a gauntlet, right? You're just, that's all you're doing all the time. Okay, as opposed to a growth mindset in which one believes that intellectual acumen is mutable through practice, productive discomfort, and mastery, okay? All right, so I love this. This was a 2015 paper, and sorry it cut off the, the author's names, but I can find it for anybody who wants it pretty fast. Anyway, this is the, this, what it's called, expect, it was a printed in science and expectations of brilliance is the beginning of the title, so you could look it up that way. So what is this? So this is, this is field specific b ability beliefs, that is the practitioners of this field, it's, it's what they believe, it's not based on anything other than their beliefs, right? So the, partic particular, uh, the participants in the field believe that you, that you need innate, the farther out you are this way, the more you need innate ability to be successful in this field. And this is the percentage of US PhDs who are female. So you can see there's a strong correlation between those fields which consider that you have to have innate ability to do these things versus fields that feel that through Trial to, through master, hard work and mastery, you can um, you can make progress and be successful in the field. And um, I don't know about you, but I don't think molecular biology is any picnic. Um, and yet, the beliefs of the practitioners themselves, you have this high correlation. I want to show one more. It, also in this paper, they have this. This is again field-specific ability beliefs versus the percentage of U.S. PhDs who are African American, okay? And again, the correlation's not quite so strong, but it's, it's definitely there. But I just wanna point out a couple things that I love about this. First of all, here's physics, okay? That's not surprising. But check this out, okay? <laughs> I mean, this, we're physicists, so this, this amuses me no end, okay? Okay, but there is good news here. Here's psychology, and thank God, here's education. Right? So educators believe that they can educate you, that people can learn stuff, that, that, that intellectual acumen is not immutable. Okay, so when you take all of these factors, imposter phenomenon, stereotype, that belonging and uncertainty, and fixed mindset, all of which tend to be exacerbated by contingent identities such as race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, etc., you get you add them all together, you get paralysis. This is, you know, our students can't do anything if all this is going on. All right, so an important disclaimer, I don't want to reinforce a deficit model. These are all predictable responses of psychologically healthy individuals to cues from their environment. Okay. So, and then these factors are exacerbated by what's known in the field as the hidden curriculum, which is knowledge about norms and expectations in the college environment that are unspoken and often taught informally by parents and others in high socioeconomic communities in well-resourced high schools. So in well-resourced high schools, you learn in high school how to go to office hours, not in your senior year of college. Okay. So how, do, how, does, but, so how does one mitigate these things? So um, Carl Wyman and his colleagues, I think it was in 2016, wrote a paper on mitigating imposter phenomenon, giving out a survey on the first day of class who's experiencing this, and just showing the class the next day 
that three quarters of you think you're in the bottom quarter of the class, okay? A letter three weeks in that the students write to the next group of students, just seeing what their experience has been in the first three weeks and how they've, they've made an adjustment to college, okay? Um, stereotype threat. Mitigating that, examples of women and members of marginalized racial and ethnic groups. I have colleagues in my chemistry department who in the first, for every lecture in Chemistry 101, you walk into the lecture hall and there's a picture of a woman or person of color, chemist, describing the chemistry that they do. They never talk about them, they're just up there every time, someone, every time the students walk in. And the response from the women and students of color has been extraordinary. And some, of, and some of the white men as well. Okay. Discuss stereotype throughout with students, but only in individual interactions or with affinity groups. You don't want to do that in the class. Okay. Mitigating by, um, belonging uncertainty. Attend to messages from the physical environment. Examples of women and members of mar marginalized racial and ethnic groups. Promote cooperative, decentralized, and well-structured learning environments. Okay. Promoting a growth mindset. There's lots, of, there's lots of good research on what to do. Some of the things are making assignments transparent. It's like, what does, uh, I, I could say a lot more about that if you want to talk to me about that uh, afterwards. But in, in any case, um, and then, okay. So then I want to go on to number four, which is personal support. This involves acknowledging and celebrating the whole student, including their interests and concerns beyond physics. So actually tell them how impressed you are that they have commitments to their family and community and a sense of purpose and that they're interested in physics, that all those things are true about them. Okay, so, okay. so now I say to departments, and, I, and I've already talked to the diversity committee, maybe the chair, I have a few conversations to find out what they're doing and say, what can you do? Here, give me, let me give you an example. So, what, you, what, what, are all the, what are the scarce resources in every department? Time and money. So you wanna leverage those, choose, you wanna leverage your scarce resources. So choose one to three initiatives to which the department as a whole can commit. So I was recently at a large research university and on their web pages is something about 70% of undergraduates participating in research. So I asked around about that and everybody thought the number was kind of funky, but, but clearly they wanted to send a message to undergraduates that they could participate in research. So for them, I said, okay, so choose an initiative and then those who are working to bring the initiative to fruition are doing professional work on behalf of the department, much like teaching a course or serving as chair. They need, so what you wanna do is leverage faculty eff efforts with those of uh, staff and postdocs, graduate students, and undergraduates. Okay, so this was their example. Research shows that involvement in research early in an undergraduate's tenure is the most effective way to cre create persistence in the major. Okay, so if you have the luxury of being at a large research institution, this is a great way to go. Why? It increases the sense of belonging. You're in a lab, you're in a real lab. It increases the sense of physics identity. It's an effective avenue for mentoring, and it can address financial stressors if you pay the students for the research. So, how does one launch a department-wide initiative? Well, the goal would be to provide every student from an underrepresented, and I will use your student of color from now on, yep, uh, to provide every student from an underrepresented um, community of color, African-American, Hispanic, Latinx, Native American with a research experience in the first year or the summer after their first year, okay? That's the goal. So you're a big research university. What commitments do individual faculty need to make? Well, each faculty member commits to sponsoring at least one underrepresented student of color undergrad in his or her research group, okay? What is the department? What are the department commitments? Well. Grad students, postdocs, and other lab personnel are, are encouraged to mentor these students as part of their professional responsibilities, not in addition to their res professional responsibilities. So all those little jobs you have to, that have to take place for a lab to work, this is one of them, and then they don't do some other ones of them. Okay, keeping up the website or whatever it is, put this on the list. Okay, so then what are the department commi commitments? They su the support for the research co cohort activities. So 
what does the cohort, what might this cohort need from the department or university? Maybe summer housing, right? So that's what the department is finding that, uh, finding those university resources. Um, sponsoring poster sessions for the students after they do the, the social activities for the students. Okay, so then what are the department or university level commitments? The mentors, those are the people in the labs directly supervising them, they receive sub substantive training and support in culturally responsive mentoring, okay? Because again, most of them are not gonna share the identities of the people that, uh, with whom they're working. And that the students receive financial compensation for their research involvement. Because one of the biggest things that African American students said to us was, financial stresses are a major factor in whether or not I can complete my education. So if we're paying them to do physics research rather than their, them having to work at 7-Eleven, this is a win-win, okay? So then the students need skills, right? So what do they need? They need, to, they need to know where and how do I look on campus for a research internship? Where, how do I look off campus? Even find them, what is a research internship and how would I find one? How do I find funding opportunities? These big research universities, they got all kinds of pockets of money for, to fund undergraduate research. How do they find them? How do I find funding for off campus? How do I write a resume? At Reed College, we had, we had a website from the, um, it's called Life Beyond Read, Career Services, Interns, all that, and it said, here is a list of all of these research internships that you can do this summer. And then it said, download your resume here. <laughs> I called him up, I said, no, no. <laughs> it's like, if you want help writing a resume, click here, okay? So again, those are the barriers where a kid says, I don't have a resume, so obviously, I don't even belong on this web page. Okay, so how do I find, how do I write a resume? How do I write a personal statement? Okay, so then the question is who does what? So who does the coaching on finding and funding in, in, internships? That might be faculty or graduate student mentors. Selection of research mentors, that's gonna be the research group faculty. So who in my group would be good at mentoring this student and how do I give them professional credit for doing so? The training of the research mentors is probably the Campus Center for Teaching and Learning, um, who I hope have people who could talk about culturally responsive mentoring. The group events for the research students, setting up the poster session, setting up some social activities. That could be an undergraduate paid position, perhaps somebody who was in the research program the year before. An assessment of the program, really important to assess. Is this working? Is this helping our students uh, persist in the physics major? Would be the department's DEI committee with, the inst with help from institutional research. Okay. So, um, so that's an example. And then I would give e I give each institution a couple more examples. Here's you know pick from the menu. Here are a few things you can do. Given what I know about you, these are things that might be working. So finally, what I ask them to do is. Always start from a student's strengths. They're interested and capable of majoring in physics. That's a real strength. What are their other strengths and how can they use their strengths to meet their challenges? Which by the way is my parenting philosophy. They come out with personalities. You know, so there are two things you can do. Try to instill a moral compass and help them use their strengths to protect their weaknesses. That's the whole job, right? So communicate your admiration of their strengths, accomplishments, and broader interests and commitments. Communicate your confidence in them to address their challenges productively. It's not hand-holding, it's teaching. Okay, so, there you go. Thanks, Mary, that was great. We have uh, time for a few questions. Um, thank you. Um, this is an exciting talk and uh, we have read the report. Um, so I am from San Diego State University, which is a basically undergraduate. We not are one. We have a lot of minority students. I'm the advisor for the department and I've, I found that there's sometimes a disconnect. Like our problem starts earlier with half of our students coming in needing college algebra. Um, 
half of our students come in and need fundamental high school level mathematics and need a whole year before they even can take their first physics class. And you know what I find as mentor is that they all, you know, all of them that are not really prepared, and, and there are some minority students that are prepared, drop out. And so uh, I don't know, you know, is there any advice on how to deal with a department with the issue that you, you know, you even get the students to the stage that they are part of your physics classes? So that does require some structural changes. Um, so um, a lot of, there's a lot of work on having multiple pathways into the major. So a great thing would be to have students who are interested in physics but need a year of math preparation even before they can start the regular physics curriculum, that there be some courses for them. You might even encourage them to take courses intended for non-majors. The astronomy course, the course on light and color, whatever it is. So those more qualitative courses may be intended as general ed courses, but that can still keep their interest in physics alive while they take the math courses. And then you might also consider what, um, what we call it, read a short major. So some students are, um, some students are interested in going on to grad school. But some students they may want to do uh, high school teaching. They just they may want to work in the in the tech sector in some way. So, do they need three quarters of quantum mechanics? Maybe not to do that. So think about how you could how you could adjust the curriculum so that they could essentially enter the curriculum as sophomores and still graduate on time. Um, so those are those are some suggestions. But certainly. Identifying students who would be interested in a physics major who need that math background, that, that's a really important step. And then giving them some kind of social cohesion to be a group that's, that's moving toward that goal. There's one back here. So I was interested in your analogy with physics experiments. Um, so if somebody measured some temperature and density data, um, and you know, could document that they had done that. Uh, most physicists would trust that they had done it and that the data was accurate and believe them. Um, I see that it seems harder for physicists to believe data about uh, identity and uh, social science data. Could you maybe comment on how to get buy-in there? So thank you so much for that comment because I forgot to say something really important which is you need to collect the data for your department, right? And so there, um, somebody who can help you do that is the American Physical Society. So the um, Committee on the Status of Women in Physics and the Committee on Minorities both offer site visits for physics departments to do exactly this, to help physics departments um, reflect on their own cultures and the experiences of their own constituents. So one of the things, those site visits, before the site visit, undergrads, graduate students, postdocs, staff, pre-tenure faculty and post-tenure faculty all fill out, um, fill out questionnaires about their experiences in the department. And then all that information is, um, uh, all that information is collected and given back to the department so they can actually see what those responses were before the site visit. And then during the site visit, um, the, the um, committee meets with those various groups independently. So they'll meet with um, undergraduate women separate from undergraduate men, undergraduate um, folks of, uh, students of color separate from undergraduate white students. And then they spend two days on the campus, so they've collected both the quantitative information in the form of the pre-visit um, questionnaires, and then qualitative information from um, uh, from from the visit. So, it's a group of physicists who come and do this. So that I think um, increases the you know uh, the buy-in. So it's even though actually social sciences visiting would be more effective um, in terms of probably understanding listening more clearly to, to things that are being said. Um, in terms of buy-in, you need physicists to go and do it. So. I think we have to move on, I'm sorry. 
we're uh, out of time for this talk. Uh, thank Mary yep. one more time. Okay, our last speaker of this session is Jesus Pando. Um, let me switch this over. All right. Thank you. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jesus Pando. I'm going to be addressing something perhaps a little or much more narrow in focus. So, we've heard from Linnell and from Vernon and from uh, Mary Beth, uh, um, Roberto about sort of global kinds of issues. I'm going to focus uh, in this talk on things that actually happen in the classroom and things that you might be able to do in the classroom as issues arise. I should say that m most of my experience has been on more national efforts. I shared the Committee on Minorities. I, I, I did some work on, on, on Team Up uh, with Linnell. We served on something called um, APS IDEA. And so this is a relatively new uh, area for me, so I'm a little nervous. Plus, uh, I was at the Springsteen Show in Milwaukee on Tuesday. I'm still tired from that. I don't know how a 72-year-old man still does that, but uh, I'm tired from that. Okay, so. Um, these are the folks that are involved uh, in, in this work. So Marty Baylor is a co-PI at Carleton. Um, Peggy O'Neill, uh, we've heard several times about the importance of social scientists. Peggy O'Neill is a social scientist. She's a co-PI with us. Sharon Blackwell-Jones is also a social scientist. She's a, a cultural competency uh, specialist. Um, we have an external evaluator, Alexis, uh, and then Karen Walters-Conti is uh, innovation Fund Liaison, because this work was funded by an APS Innovation Fund. Um, so we received that award in 2021 to carry out um, this work. And so what we're trying to do, well, let me give you the roadmap of what, what I'm going to talk about. The rationale for the program, uh, the personnel, because that's important. Um, the target audience, that's also important. Then I'll describe a little bit uh, about uh, the program. Results, we have an N of two. We've done this twice. That doesn't bother me. I'm a cosmologist. I have an N of one. Uh, so I, I'm used to dealing with just one universe. That's OK. Um, and then issues and future plans. OK. So rationale. Um, so um, I don't know if this is going to play or not. Uh, but what you would have seen here, oh, wait, that's going to play. OK. I'm not sure how I do this exactly. OK. So this is what typically might happen in a classroom. I don't, there's no sound, maybe? Yeah, sure. Okay. What you're seeing here is a group of students being uh, asked to do a, a project or a problem, solve a problem. And what you're seeing is something that happens in a typical classroom often, where there are certain EDI effort, uh, EDI issues that are actually happening that are often blind to, to the instructor. So you have. It's, for example, uh, a, a woman, somebody who identifies as a woman, being ignored. Um, you have an African-American student being very dominant, which is also maybe sometimes unusual or maybe surprising to some folks. Um, and so this is something that happens in many, many classrooms and often is not recognized by the instructor. Um, so that's one reason, uh, example, of what a rationale for this. Uh, I can't stop this now. Nope. Uh, there. Okay. And this is, you can find this at the Inclusive STEM project, by the way. Um, <laughs> right. I'm also technologically challenged. Uh, okay. And then it's backwards. Hmm. Okay. Another example, and this is a real example. Um, that happened that we use in, in, our, in our training. Um, and uh, very few things have been changed, just to make sure we mask the identities of people. So what happens is that there's a video that surfaces in which a member of the class uh, says, I don't understand why we say F dot 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 when we all know what it means. I mean, the, he says fuck immigrants is what he says, right? But we have to put dot 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 for some reason. But that's what he says, right? Um, and um, the next day, several students, DACA students, raise a concern in class. 
um, that they don't feel comfortable with the student in class, right? So this is happening real time to the instructor in class. Um, the student who posted the, this video uh, uh, apologizes, but it sounds fake to the students that are in the class, and maybe it is, maybe it isn't, we don't know. Um, and the students are raise an issue that they don't feel secure, they don't accept the apology, the whole class breaks down. The instructor actually has to stop the class, okay, and come back the next day. This is a real issue that happened. Okay. And we use this in, in, in um, as, as we're developing the program, but these are the kinds of issues that we thought that was the reason why there might be a, a need to have a workshop in which instructors can learn how to handle it, uh, issues that arise like this in the classroom. Um, and what we noticed, or what we thought, and uh, most of this I should say, when I say we, I'm, I'm saying Marty, she did a lot of this work, um, that we realized that there's a growing body of uh, resources available to physics educators about EDI issues. Uh, but that physics educators themselves in the classroom are hesitant to engage in these kinds of uh, uh, critical conversations in the classroom. There is, it, it is very um, unusual for a physics instructor to start the first class or to have a learning objective, e, an EDI learning objective as part of the course, for example, and so forth. Um, there's lots of reasons. They don't have the skills to do this, perhaps. Um, there's uh, a fear of burdening minoritized students. And so as many of us of color know, when there's an issue that arises, people look to us, look to me. When it was a uh, Latino, a Mexican-American, Mexican issue occurs. What about those American tourists that got killed in Mexico? I, I, I don't know. They shouldn't have, I don't know. I don't, that, I don't know why you're asking me that, but I get asked. Um, so there's that fear, perhaps. Um, so what we try to do, and this is the rationale for the program, what we try to do is these resources are out there, and there is uh, physicists in the classrooms that need these skills. So is there a way in which we can bring these two together and, and give a set of, uh, of um, skills, I hate using that word, and you'll see why in a moment, can we build capacity for these physicists to engage in EDI efforts real time in the classroom as these incidents are happening? Okay, so that's the, that's the rationale uh, behind these, uh, this program, what we were trying to do. So it was important from the very beginning for us to think about what the team was gonna be like that was gonna develop this, this workshop. So uh, Marty and I, Marty is African American, uh, female, identifies as female. I'm Mexican American and I identify as male. We have both our, our own lived experience, right? We both have our own lived experience. That doesn't mean we have expertise. Experience and expertise are not the same thing. I have experienced a lot of things, people have experienced other things, I don't have expertise. So we realized that we needed expertise in this. And we did. We, from the very beginning, we sought out uh, as a co PI a social scientist. And it is, uh, I think, been pointed out by several of the speakers, this does not work if you don't include social scientists. They have the expertise to do this kind of work. So um, we've, we looked at two, two specific skill sets. We found uh, somebody who was uh, skilled in, having, in holding these critical conversations, and I'll, I'll talk about what that means a little bit later, and another expert in cultural competency, somebody who had the, uh, the expertise in how you deal with cultural issues. Then together we sort of developed the learning goals of the workshop. Um, using this as a partial guide, then we developed the rubric uh, to evaluate applicants that were gonna be this EDI fellows, right? Um, and then um, we send out word through the APS uh, announcing this program and we started soliciting applications to become EDI fellows. Um, and these are our fellows here. Uh, so. Uh, on the far left is Peggy, she's our social scientist, our critical uh, conversation specialist, and then the, the folks in the middle are, are, uh, are EDI fellows, uh, Prasad Venigupal, Kelly Sullivan, Teresa Hurd, uh, Andrew Serediski, Beatriz Burula-Calambindo, uh, Michael Farback in the red shirt, and then Sharon Jones is our cultural competency expert behind him, and then the rest of us. So that's the team that we chose um, uh, through this process. 
And one of the interesting things is almost all the fellows are from non-research intensive universities. Um, the only fellow that's from a large research intensive university is not on a tenure track. That maybe says something. Um, this is the kind of applicants we got. That turned out to be a good thing, however, because the group that we got is just excellent. All, all the people that we got are excellent. They care about these issues, even though their, their departments are relatively small, to the point that you know, one or two, uh, one person has, I think, two physics majors in their program, right? So these are relatively small programs. Um, we, however, did not develop any curriculum. We had learning goals, but we not, did, did not develop any curriculum until the fellows had been uh, chosen, and then we co-developed the curriculum together. And um, so this was asking a lot. We've heard several times about you're asking a lot from people. Uh, these, uh, we had monthly meetings uh, in which the curriculum was developed. Uh, we had a two-day workshop at uh, the American Center for Physics down, you know, in in College Park, uh, where we put the finishing touches on the workshop. Um, the fellows were also expected to do monthly reflections centered around the topics that we, so we asked them to think about the process and think about what, what was going through. This was at the suggestion, of course, of the social scientist, because as a physicist, I would have never thought to do that. Um, that's turned out to be extremely valuable. Um, and this is what we could afford to pay. I mean, this is the issue that one is always faced with, right? We, the, this is a two-year grant. So they're paid for two years, three hour per month about commitment. It's nowhere near that. They've put in a lot more time than that, right? Um, and they get a $2,500 stipend. Okay. So the target audience, we thought this was important too. So this is a pilot. You need to remember this is a pilot. We're trying to work to see how one could develop a workshop like this. So um, it's not meant for all physics educators, this pilot. Um, it's, so who is it meant for? Well, first of all, you have to have a level of awareness. We, we, we don't have the capacity to train you that EDI issues are going on in the classroom. You have to have a level of awareness that that's happening in the classroom. And you have to have a desire to try to deal with it. Because people who are aware, we believe, there are EDI issues, but don't have any desire to deal with it. And it's understandable because some of this stuff is hard. I think Linnell said that this is emotionally taxing on you. It costs you emotionally to deal with this, and it's hard work to do. So you have to have one to do that. So that was our target audience. We wanted folks in the classroom. This is not meant to be a general diversity training, which we heard earlier maybe doesn't work. It's not meant to do that. It's very targeted. It's, going to, it's meant to teach you something that you can use in the classroom, particularly in the introductory sequences, because that's where we see the most students, right? And not only do we see physics students, so not only could we be doing harm to physics majors, we could be doing harm to chemistry majors, biology majors, and so forth, right? Um, and since this is a pilot, we, had, we targeted a few um, audiences chosen. Uh, we, uh, so we chose this, um, some APS standing committees, so the Committee on Education, the Committee on Minorities, uh, the Committee on the Status of Women in Physics, all have agreed to be co-sponsors of these, uh, this workshop. So we're doing workshops for that, that audience. Um, we did a workshop this past Sunday here at the March meeting. We'll do another workshop at the April meeting, and we'll do one at the summer APP, AAPT meeting. Um, and these are targeted, so if you agreed to come to the workshop, you must agree to give us feedback. The workshop is videotaped, but it only the facilitator is videotaped, because again, we're using this to try to train ourselves on what, what makes an effective workshop. Okay. So what is the program? So I told you about uh, who, the rationale for the program, who is working on the grant, and what our target audience is for this pilot. So what is, the, what is it that we're trying to do? Well, first of all, it's a commitment. It's a three-hour workshop. Okay, so it's, it's a commitment, which makes it hard to schedule in meetings, which is why we have to do it, like, for example, on the Sunday uh, at the March meeting. Um, each workshop is co-facilitated by one of the EDI fellows and a social scientist. So they're both in the room and they're co-facilitating the workshop. Um, also in the audience is our external evaluator and then one of the senior, so me and Marty are the senior physicists, uh, either one of us is in attendance, right? Um, so this, the evaluator is there to see the effectiveness of the workshop and so forth, 
Marty and I as having, ex having lived experience of being folks of color going through the physics community sort of gauge the audience and so forth. And we have sort of a different set that we're analyzing, different criteria that we're looking. So it, the program essentially has four um, pillars on which it rests. First of all, we want to increase the self-awareness of uh, intersecting identities impact the classrooms. And we've heard a lot about here about identities. We actually do a lot more, well, we mention identities. Couple that to the power that each identity has. So for example, I, I have multiple identities. I'm Mexican-American, I'm male, I'm, and so forth, right? There is a certain power that carries my, with, with my maleness, right? I have a certain power dynamic that comes with that and affects interactions. I have less power when my Mexican-American identity is, is pronounced or seen, right? So you have all these, all these identities, but associated with all those identities, what's important is that they all carry different power structure. Um, once we do that, um, hopefully they become aware that others have similar kinds of um, characteristics, that they come with intersecting cultural identities, and each of those identities carry some power with them. And those manifest themselves differently in the classroom. And then hopefully at this point, you've built uh, the capacity to now identify EDI tensions when they are happening. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, explore these a little more detail in just a moment. So at this point, you've become aware of your own identities and how that can play a role in the classroom. You've uh, identified that others have similar kinds of characteristics. Your students are interacting. In that video that we saw in which the, the woman is being shut down in, in these interactions and now you're able to see that there's a power dynamic that's going on there. It's not, that, it's not only that her identity is a woman and the others are male, it's that there is a power differential there that it manifests itself in that classroom. Um, so you're able to identify those kinds of things that are going on. And then we practice uh, techniques to constructively intervene into the classroom while this is happening. Um, yeah. Um, I'll have more to say about that in a moment. Okay, so how about that first one? So what it is not, and I think many of, these, many of us have said this, we're not solving racism or ableism or anyism. You can't do that, right? Um, it's not the end of a process. As, as the facilitators and of the developers of this curriculum, we don't have all the answers. That's, that's, we, we don't have that. So there's lots of things we're not gonna be able to answer. We also are not accepting that where we are is where, is the limit of where we could be. Right? I think this was Linnell's point earlier, right? We don't accept that as a, as a principle. So these are all things that we do not accept as part of the problem, but it is not part of the program. Okay. So the self-awareness bit. So what we do is we introduce the scenario, we, I call it the progressive scenario. This is a scenario in which the, uh, the, the man is heard, the male student, white male student is heard saying fuck immigrants on a video and you know, it shows up in the, in the classroom and so forth. So we use that to first explore the self, your own self-awareness. You cannot, several, have, several people have mentioned, or some of the speakers have mentioned about um, um, being uh, um, intentional about what you're doing and, and, and so forth, but you can't do that until you understand that you yourself come in with some identities and you're see what you're seeing is you're seeing it through a lens, that lens of your lived experience, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with this. All of us have that lens. The point is if you don't recognize that you're seeing it through a lens, then you're going to interpret or misinterpret or not be able to constructively intervene when issues arise, right? So we introduce the progressive scenario um, and other exercises in which we explore self-awareness. We do these things, cultural circles, in which you, 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 you draw a Venn diagram and you put all your identities in there and you make bigger the ones you think the you have the most power and the ones that have the least power, the most power in a physics context, the most power at home, and so forth. So you can uh, understand these kinds of um, self-awareness things. And so again, so um, I think it was, uh, Mary, you said that physics, it's, it's, it is a myth that physics doesn't have a culture. We, we explore that, that, that physics doesn't have a culture. Um, um, 
But in fact, it does, right? And that, that culture plays itself, this, this myth of meritocracy, the myth of genius, all of these things play, out, play themselves out in the classroom. These students, I don't know how, they have learned this myth, right? They come in with this, with, with this myth already, the, the lone genius scientist, right? Uh, never mind that CERN papers have thousand authors on it. It's the lone genius scientist that, that does all this stuff, right? And so um, we, we identify that culture. We actively interrogate that culture, ask, ask the participants to interrogate that culture, and then learn, hopefully, um, that there are power dynamics, as I said, associated with it, it, these identities. It's not that all of us have identity, different identities. We all know that. Right? We all know that all of us have our multiple perspectives. That's not the issue. The issue is that those perspectives or those identities carry with them power that you feel and others perceive that power in you or that lack of power in you in interactions. So we learn that and how those manifest in the classroom. Again, for example, when uh, the woman is shut down in the, in the a problem uh, solving session that they're having. Um, or when um, in, in the progressive scenario, when uh, the DACA students uh, suddenly feel empowered as a group to, to, to interrupt the class, right? Once, you've, once we've explored that, um, hopefully at this point you are aware that others have uh, intersecting identities. And once again, we use this progressive uh, scenario and uh, video and other exercises to, to um, make one aware that others have intersecting identities and that what you're seeing, experiencing, what you're experiencing is not what the student is experiencing, at least completely, right? For once again, in that one video that I showed, um, Almost everyone in the, in, who looks at that video the first time will see the woman is being shut down and ignored and so forth. They don't see that the black male student is expressing his dominance because oftentimes black males are shut down. And so this is him expressing that, that dominance. And again, if you, if you are not aware that th those multiple things are going on, then it's, you're going to interrupt that, that interaction in a way that is going to maybe help one student but cause damage to another, right? So you have to be aware of, of these, uh, that others have intersecting identities. You have to, again, you have to, so you, you externalize what you learned about yourself and put it, uh, understand that others have the same kind of um, um, multiple identities with powers associated with them um, and that they manifest in the classroom. So I don't know how many of you, but the first time I started doing uh, uh, Group, uh, group work with students, after about a semester, I realized that the women were always doing the note taking and the men were always doing the, the messing with the gizmos and stuff. And I go, wait, no, no. I mean, I didn't realize that the first time. And that was, you know, that is an EDI issue that's going on in the classroom that needs to be interrupted, right? Oop. Okay. Wrong button. Okay. Now, hopefully, at this point, um, the, the, the hope is that at this point in the workshop, you have gained some capacity to identify these tensions. That you at least are aware that you have identities that have power that are being, uh, that you're bringing to the classroom and that are being perceived by the students in the classroom. And that the same is true for the students in the classroom. And so that hopefully that you are able to identify these ten. Sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button. Uh, once again, we use this progressive scenario, videos, and other exercises um, to um, alert you that there are EDI tensions going on in, in the classroom, whether it's because of gender, because of it's a race, because of um, whatever it might be, religious differences. Um, all these uh, ableism, all these things are going on in the classroom and um, you are now at least able to identify them. Sometimes there's nothing that needs to be done, right? Sometimes. Many times it's probably better if something is, it's, 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 it's probably better that you identify and it's better still that you identify and can do something constructive to interrupt what's going on. So, um, 
the one technique that we use to um, constructively intervene in the classroom that you can be used also outside of the classroom is a technique called STOP. Um, so STOP stands for uh, stop, although it's actually pause, uh, take a breath, observe, and proceed. So what this means is imagine that you're in this classroom now where the DACA students have raised their hands and have started to raise holy hell, okay? And rightfully so, you might think, or not rightfully so. I don't know. It doesn't matter. That's happening, right? The first thing that, th that um, the social scientists have taught us is the first thing that you have to do is just stop. Just stop. Stop the class. Stop yourself. Don't think. Just let that emotion run through you, okay? Because you're not going to be able to effectively interrupt or assess or intervene if, if you're, if, like for me, DACA is a trigger for me, right? That's, I mean, when they put kids in cages during the previous administration, it wasn't just that incident. It's a history of incidents that happens like that, and it's a trigger, right, for me. So I have to let that wash through me because I have to deal with the, the class in the moment. So that's what stop is. You just, you don't think, you just stop. You stop the class and you let that sort of uh, uh, wash through you. Then you take the breath. This is now where you're starting ready. Now you're going to have to start getting, getting yourself ready to intervene, to take some action. Okay, so you, you actually take a breath. You feel your body. Uh, you, you feel your, your actually, they, I mean, these social scientists will tell you, feel your feet on the ground. Feel, you know, take, your, take the breath. Feel the breath going through you. Again, as you're trying to gain control of the situation, of what might be an emotional situation, so that you can perceive. And then observe. That should, see, that should say observe, not observer. Observe what's going on inside you. Do not ignore that you're being triggered, if you are being triggered. Do not ignore that you think this is silly. So you might think something is silly or not important, right? You need to observe what's going on in you before you can then lastly proceed, okay? So that's the technique we, we practice in, in the workshop. Um, and that's the end of the workshop. So we've done this twice now. And again, that, that's okay by me. Um, I, I have two universes, but I only have one. Um, so what did we learn? So the first one we did at the, uh, last October for the Committee on Education, um, and it was generally very well received. Uh, we, there, it, was, it was very good because there were a lot of physics educators in the audience, and a lot of educators that, had, that did uh, physics education research. Unfortunately, as, as you may Physics education research has a problem in dealing with underrepresented folks. Most of the work has been done, well, it's ignored groups of people. Um, uh, but that, that, uh, that feedback led us to make some changes, and that was good to have that feedback. Um, in the first scenario, we did the, um, in the first workshop, we did the, um, the video first, uh, which was, you know, kind of easy to deal and see. Um, and then we did the progressives, which was a really hard hit, right? And it's, it's sort of emotionally triggering. And we have now broken the, uh, the, that progressive scenario into stages and, and integrated both the video and the, uh, and the uh, progressive scenario throughout the workshop now. Um, we de-emphasized, we had to really work hard to do this, and it's still gonna be, I think, a, a thing we need to work on hard is, the goal of the, uh, the, the goal is not to solve the scenario, right? Where these DACA students have raised and the, 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 the um, classroom has gotten out of control. It, that's a hard one to solve. The class, you've lost control of the classroom, right? So there, there's, no, there's no way to solve that necessarily, plus it already happened, right? It's, it's to, to, instead to use that scenario to prepare you for how to intervene in things like this. Um, there was also some things that didn't engage the audience, so we, we eliminate that and, and we tried too much. Um, we also cleared up the role of each facilitator. So uh, as I told you, we have, it's co-facilitated by a physicist and by a social scientist. And it wasn't quite clear in that first workshop what the role of each one should be. And we cleared that up in the second workshop. Um, and we, <laughs> this was really hard. And maybe this was because it was in the Committee of Education. So all the participants wanted to fix the teaching. The objective, though, was 
the teaching, right? The objective was about the interactions that was going on, right? So this is not a workshop on teaching. There are plenty of workshops that do that, right? This is a workshop on how to interrupt EDI issues. And we had really hard time because everyone wanted to move to, well, the teacher did this wrong, the teacher did that wrong, ignoring what was going on in the group interactions, right? So we had to really uh, focus on that, um, make sure we focus on that. Um, and there were some logistical issues that we optimized. Um, and then we also realized that space was important, so that in the, in the Committee on Education meeting, it was a very uh, constrained space, and the facilitator, because there's two facilitators, they couldn't move around easily, and so it, it, geography forced one facilitator to stay in one place and the other facilitator to stay in another place, and there wasn't as much interaction going on. So again, the second workshop was held this past Sunday. We've not yet assessed that workshop, because I was at the Bruce Show. Um, but we have done some preliminary analysis, right? So first of all, it was really well received. Uh, again, the participants were engaged uh, in the workshop. We had several inquiries from folks of when we can, where else we might be able to hold this workshop, where else we were gonna hold it and so forth, and how we could uh, expand the audience. We're limiting the audience. Again, these are pilot workshops. So we're limiting the audience to about 20, again, so we can learn from, from what we're doing. Um, again, it was well received. So um, we have this workshop we're offering it um, uh, next month in April for the Committee on Status on Women. That'll be in a oh uh, the April meeting, and then in the Committee on Status of Women meeting, Committee on the Committee on the Status of Women in Physics meeting in April, um, and then in uh, the APT summer meeting. So we still have some more. Uh, Places where we're going to present this workshop. So, um, you know, in doing this, we've we faced and we have some future plans for this. Um, the first was the challenge of working with social scientists as physicists. Okay, Marty and I are both traditionally trained physicists, um, and it was challenging, and it's still challenging, in a very good way, uh, to work with social scientists. Um, there are jargon differences, right? That, that they use, that we use. Uh, they, they had this graphic, and finally one of the uh, fellows said, I don't understand your graphic. And all the physicists said, neither do we. And it was clear to the social scientists what that graphic meant, right? And so we had to re rework that. They used things like center yourself and, and energy, and I had no idea what that meant, right? Uh, I, I, and I'm still, I, I still don't know if I know what that means. Uh, but th there are these, these, this language that is used, right? The other thing that is really, really interesting is what is a satisfactory end? To a, a physicist, as physicists, we're trained to solve problems, and we want to solve this thing. We want to have a solution that this. Social scientists have a much more, um, a different kind of understanding of what it means to, to be at the end of something. For them, a process is an end, right? So being, through going, being a part of the process is still an end for them. And so that was, that's another sort of difference. The desire of physicists to have skills, they want to solve the problem. Um, so they want to have a solution, and they don't understand, or often they have a trouble understanding that part of the solution is the self-awareness part and the awareness of others. That is part of the solution. Um, and then time and money, of course. I mean, time and money is true for everybody, but as you saw, we pay our fellows very, very little. And so um, they, they, these fellows are just like physicists, just like us, so they need time to be trained in the social science aspect of, of, of the program. Um, and there are really not enough funds, even though as generous as the APS Innovation Fund is, it's just not enough money uh, to, to do what we need to do. Um, so again, uh, the pilot workshops will let us know if this work is needed. We, we feel like it is, but it'll let us know if it's wanted and if it's possible. I mean, that's what the pilot is for. Um, using the experience that we've learned, you know, we're, we're um, hoping to develop additional cohorts of the next fund, the next phase, we'd have uh, uh, additional cohorts of EDI fellows that would um, spread out. We'd have, again, a curriculum team still consisting of senior physicists and social scientists. That's, that's something that has worked and we know that is necessary. Um, and uh, we need to expand the number of social scientists, so we have these two, 
poor social scientists that were running around the country working all these shops, you know, all these uh, workshops. Um, so we need to expand them. And then um, we're hoping that this knowledge base of physicists and social scientists working together, that we can actually use that and present that to a community as a model of how, how to work with social scientists, how to integrate social scientists into, into a program. Um, okay, so we're in the planning stages, and I think I'm out of time. Thank you. It's after six, but I think we can take one or two questions uh, since the day's over, Fred. Yes, uh, a marvelous talk and a marvelous program. And I think we're about to touch on it, but I'm thinking about when this innovation fund runs out, obviously you've created something that then needs to be continued. And what are your thoughts about how that might go and the prospects? Yes, we are very concerned about that. Uh, we are in the, in the planning stages of, of writing now an NSF grant now. Um, and so um, next, uh, so typically we would do a debrief of this. Uh, so we're going to do a debrief of this meeting, but we're also in the planning stages now of writing, writing the next grant. Um, we think there is, you know, we want to gather more of the, the data from these workshops so that we, have, we can present a strong, a strong case. I think we have a case, uh, um, but the next two or three workshops will really tell us if that case is, is if we really have something that's useful and if there's a, a need for it, right? So, yeah. Is this the name of the workshop? How do I, is that the name of the workshop? What was the name? How will I find it on the epitome? So, so the program is called the APS EDI Fellows. Um, and again, we will have a workshop in April at the April meeting in Minneapolis as well. And also at, on, the, on the Committee of Status of Women in Physics and COM as well, but I forget when COM is, uh, uh, Committee on Minorities as well. Okay, well, let's thank our, all of our speakers one more time. And thanks to all of you for sitting through this session and participating. And one more uh, thanks to the Forum on Physics and Society and Forum on Diversity, uh, FDI, Forum on Diversity and Inclusion for hosting us. Thanks. Uh, may I say this? Thanks, both. <laughs> <Yeah>, thanks. <laughs>